hand over now to Colin and Leslie. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Crocker and Todd. Um, our first keynote uh, speaker is um, Mike Pearson. And uh, unfortunately, Mike has been very poor, has been poorly recently and has had to go into hospital. So he's going to be unable to be with us today. Um, but fortunately, uh, <laughs> Leslie, uh, head of drama at Inverness College, UHI, has agreed to, and very, and we're all very pleased about this, has agreed to to read Mike's paper. Um, <clears throat> it's it's a real shame Mike's Mike's not here because in the last conference we had on uh, ruination and decay, Mike's work kept cropping up in a number of speakers' uh, lectures. So, you know, it it would have been good if he if he'd been there as well, but. Um, Consequently, we invited him to be the keynote speaker for today's uh, presentation. Um, I'll say a few words about Mike, even though he's not here, and obviously we're going to hear his words uh, through Leslie. Uh, Mike's Professor of Performance Studies in the Department of Theatre, Film and Studies student at Aberystwyth. Um, and he's Emeritus Professor now, but he continues to, to produce and uh, undertake performance and is part of a senior performance group, Good News from the Future. Um, Mike's impact as a performer, um, certainly for me, became, became more apparent in the, in the early 1990s, and especially when he was touring with the Brith Goth Theatre Company. Um, one of Mike's, and one of the reasons that uh, I certainly became to know Mike's work and Mike himself was because his his work had a, a strong archaeological theme to it, and um, he uh, presented at a number of conferences starting in the mid archaeological conference in the mid 1990s, and at that time um, performance was starting to make an appearance in archaeology, but more through phenomenological analysis. And I, I sat in many of his presentations. The thing about Mike, he's a really nice, nice, quiet man. But when he performs, he really quite can be quite shocking. And um, to, uh, let me say, pedestrian archaeological audiences, many were quite taken aback by, by his presentations. But it, in many ways, the fact that he, he did draw on and use, or he has drawn on and used archaeology is no surprise because he's actually an undergraduate at Cardiff in the archaeology department, which is where Neil Sharp was his base, as it turns out, um, during the late 1960s, early 1970s, when Cardiff, our archaeology at Cardiff, was one of the leading uh, departments in the, in the country. Um, he's, he's written any number of books now, and um, he's also written a book with with uh, Mike Shanks, an archaeologist, which was very, which is really quite influential. Um, maybe perhaps one of his most influential works is Income I, Performance, Memory and Landscape, site and site specific performance, both of which uh, very much summarize, summarize his, his work. So it's a shame that Mike's not with us, but I'm sure Leslie is going to do an, uh, an admirable job. So thank you very much, Leslie, and I'll, I'll hand over to you now. OK, thank you. Thank you, Colin. Um, so yes, this is a bit strange for me, but I just want to say to everyone, I'm a huge fan of Mike Pearson. So so this is slightly, slightly bizarre experience for me, but it's a great honour, actually, to, to present his paper and communicate his words. So we do have a rather nice PowerPoint to go with this. So I'm just going to try and share my screen with you now. Um, OK, so. Can I just check that everybody can see that? Yes, excellent, thank you. OK. So. Um, here we go. So this is Mike's paper, Held Together by Dirt, Improvising Life on the Edge with the British Expedition to Graham Land, 1921 to 22. Um, so the first part of this paper kind of describes the initial context, the project, getting there, 1920 to 21. 
Um, okay. So they're surviving relics a few. Perhaps not surprising for the smallest expedition ever to overwinter in Antarctica and one that was undertaken with so little specialist equipment. They had a hammer, a saw, packing cases and odd nails, lots of ideas and whole shiploads of hope. For luxuries, they had an ample supply of unreliable matches, plenty of cigarettes and boxes of creme de menthe sweets, wrote Frank Debenham, first director of the Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge. For a time, the Institute Museum held their aneroid barometer, an apnea level, a brass telescope, a pair of teardrop snowshoes and a knife, a deed box with number one painted in red on the lid with T.W. Bagshaw and traces of British Imperial Antarctic Expedition in white, a homemade pennant of green silk, a candlestick fashioned from an old cigarette tin and a piece of bamboo pole and a geological hammer stamped TWB. So I'm just moving my slides. I'm hoping that you can see me moving those. Is that, are we, are we all good with these? Um, possibly not. There we go. I think I was moving the wrong PowerPoint possibly, right? So there was a box of R. R Bell and Co's Royal Wax Vesta matches collected from Waterboat Point by Lieutenant Commander Victor Bunster del Solar of the Chilean Navy during the fifth Chilean Antarctic expedition of 1950 to 51. Of their base, at the entrance to Paradise Bay on the Danco coast on the west side of the Antarctic Peninsula, little remains that is visible. One metal commemorative plaque reads Memorial Antarctic Treaty Historic Site 56 UK Expedition Leicester and Bagshaw Waterboat Point overwintered 1921, sponsored by the Fuerza Area de Chile. A second bears a diagram of the hut layout as drawn by Thomas Wyatt Bagshaw in his Two Men in the Antarctic, an expedition to Graham Land, 1920 to 22. So I'm just moving my slide along so that you can see that so there's a diagram of the of the boat and then the sort of extension to the boat um, that the men constructed when chile established the presidente gonzalez videla station in 1951 traces of their jerry built dwelling still existed the Antarctic Treaty Historic Site Registration of 1991 records the base of the boat, roots of the doorposts, and an outline of the hut and extension as surviving. The site was gradually degraded by natural processes of climactic and environmental attrition, by burial with guano from the large penguin rookery, and by human intervention. So I'm quoting, burnt and bulldozed along with builders rubbish in a clearing up operation by the Chilean occupiers. Traces of occupancy now largely expunged, it is unremarked by passing tourist cruisers. So it was on the 3rd of August, 1895, that delegates at the Sixth International Geographical Congress at the Imperial Institute in London passed a resolution declaring 
that this Congress records its opinion that the exploration of the Antarctic regions is the greatest piece of geographical exploration still to be undertaken. Between 1898 and 1921, in the so-called heroic era of Antarctic exploration, ships from Belgium, France, Germany, Sweden, Australia and Japan ventured south. Amongst British parties were those of William Spears Bruce, Carsten Borsch Grebnik and Robert Falcon Scott and Ernest Shackleton. Early expeditions frequently arrived ill prepared. After initial sledging escapades in 1902, Scott noted the errors were patent. Food, clothing, everything was wrong. The whole system was bad. The quest for an effective system, a combination of shelter, equipment, nutrition and transport that could ensure survival, and the success of exploratory and scientific enterprises in the coldest, driest, windiest environment on Earth would come to preoccupy polar parties. Some employed the latest technology with varying success. I'm just moving my slides along to keep up here. So I think we've got a primer stove there. Um, primer stoves worked, motor vehicles failed. Others, notably Norwegian Roald Amundsen, favoured approaches based on indigenous models and practices, the use of dogs, fur clothing and seal hunting. But the First World War changed attitudes to heroism. After 1918, only two further expeditions journeyed south. The rather aimless Shackleton Rowlett expedition of 1921, on which Shackleton himself died of a heart attack, and John Lachlan Cope's British Imperial expedition. So Cope had been a member of Ernest Shackleton's fateful Ross Sea Party, who was stranded on the other side of Antarctica as Shackleton's ship Endurance founded. Cope's initial plans for his British Imperial expedition had been grandiose and hubristic. It was to involve a personnel of 54 and amongst its objectives were circumnavigating the continent, using Scott's ship Terra Nova, conducting the first flight to the South Pole in a Blackburn kangaroo, extending Swedish explorer Niels Otto Norden Skull's mapping in 1901-3 of the western shore of the Weddell Sea and assessing resources for commercial exploitation. Uh, and again, we have some nice slides just illustrating some of those points coming up. Um, I think that's Cope, it's like a grainy photograph there. Um, and that is that is obviously the, the, the plane, the biplane they were going to use to help their scientific um, exploration. But Cope never came close to raising the 100,000 required. Eventually, Incredibly, only four men sailed south. Cope as leader, Australian aviator and photographer George Hubert Wilkins as second in command, and 29-year-old Maxine Charles Lester, a lieutenant in the Royal Naval Reserve and recently second mate on a tramp steamer as navigator, and 19-year-old Thomas Wyatt Bagshaw, a student dropout from Cambridge as a geologist. So they travelled separately, hitching lifts on Norwegian whaling ships, rendezvousing on Christmas Eve 1920 
in the flooded volcanic caldera of Deception Island in the South Shetlands, a charnel house of rotting whale flesh. Once assembled, Cope's revised plan was to disembark at Hope Bay on the northern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, known at that time as Graham Land, and then trek south to Snow Hill, to Snow Hill Island and occupy Northern Skjold's deserted hut. But heavy sea ice deterred the whalers who recommended instead landing on the west coast and then sledging the 60 miles across the peninsula and once there, picking up Northern Skjold's route. On the 12th of January 1921, the four men went ashore on a tiny island, 215 metres long by 100 metres wide and six metres above sea level, joined to the mainland by a spit at low tide and occupied by 12,000 nesting gentoo and 1,000 chinstrap penguins and their guano. What Bagshaw compared to both a country garden and a small prison camp, other islands in the miniature archipelago, they're named Coal Point and South Island. Here they found a flat bottom boat, 8.4 metres long, 3.2 metres wide and 1.1 metres high that had been used for ferrying fresh water to the factory ship Nico and abandoned eight years earlier. It looks something like this. It was completely decked over with a sliding entrance hatch. When packed with senegrass, grass, I think it's Arctic sedge uh, and sacking, it provided convenient though cramped sleeping quarters. With the addition of a lounge built from packing cases and sail canvas sewn by Leicester, it would become their expeditionary base at the eponymous water boat point. Too heavy to move, the boat lay permanently at an angle of eight degrees. Later lined with eider downs, it resembled Bagshaw's idea of the appearance of a padded cell. But recce trips in the interior revealed, um, I quote, a range of mountains from 2,000 to 6,000 feet in height, steep, rugged and covered with glacier. Any crossing to Snow Hill Island would be beyond their means. And so on February the 25th, 1921, an extraordinary decision was taken to split the party. Cope proposed travelling back to Montevideo with the whalers to find a ship suitable for conveying them into the Weddell Sea. Against Norwegian advice, Bagshaw and Leicester were, <coughs> excuse me, were persuaded to remain and carry out, quote, a programme, albeit limited, of observations and scientific measurements. <clears throat> Cope would collect them the following year and try again for Snow Hill Island. Wilkins quit altogether with the intention of organising his own expedition in the United States. Should Cope fail to return, the factory ship Sven Foyne 1 offered to pick up the young explorers early in 1922, fortuitously, as it turned out. So the next section of this paper um, has a subheading isolation 1921 to 22. And so began a 12 month sojourn on the, on the edge, quoting two people alone on a continent the size of Europe and Australia combined with no prospect of rescue in the interim. 
Our kingdom was an uninhabited continent, yet with all its five and a half million square miles, we could walk only a few hundred yards, wrote Bagshaw. That isolation was absolute. Without radio, quote, the affairs of the world were closed to us. Without a planned system, and without knowing if they could even tolerate each other, with little scientific training and barely adequate supplies, what they were about to do, quote, smacked of genuine lunacy. With little appreciation of the physical, emotional and psychological trials ahead, we were taking one big risk. But this was not entirely self-sacrifice in the name of research. They expected remuneration in return for their observations in meteorology, hydrography, geology and biology, and for the contracted photographs that would salvage the reputation of the expedition. From the outset, their efforts had a future orientated aspect. Cope never returned. On the 13th of January 1922, Bagshaw and Lester were picked up by Sven Foyne one, one year and a day after their landing. Though essentially unprepared and invisible to the outside world, invisible to the outside world, indeed we might think of them as outside explorers. Bagshaw and Lester, nevertheless, found a way to quote, go on in life. We immediately settled ourselves down to the idea of not seeing another man for at least 10 months, wrote Lester in his article, An Expedition to Graham Land, 1920 to 1922 in 1923. Their undertaking was essentially task based, set by the clock. And were they to be successfully collected of fixed duration? When the whalers returned prematurely on December the 18th, 1921, they insisted on stay, staying a three further weeks to complete one full year of records. It was a self-imposed schedule that focus their activities, an unwavering application to their assignment in hourly, daily and weekly routines that set a rhythm, a pulse to their existence. It was akin to what in my field we'd call time-based, rule-based performance. This schedule was punctuated by irregular, though much anticipated occasions, celebration. Easter was marked by two creme de menthe sweets, birthdays by Christmas pudding, midwinter by baked beans. Every baked bean was dealt with individually so as to obtain the maximum of satis satisfaction, wrote Bagshaw. Their initial timetable comprised up at 7.30, breakfast eight, lunch one, tea five, Supper 10. They took it in turns to take readings and to complete other chores. Whoever recorded at 8 a.m. also made breakfast. In an attempt to lead a civilized existence, Saturday eventually became devoted to hut cleaning. But both special events and mundane matters of housekeeping are subsumed here in a set of unprecedented circumstances that renders each moment singular. They had a rudimentary weather screen made by a whaler's carpenter that was equipped with thermometers, anemometer and aneroids. They kept a weather log, an ice log and a natural history log, quote, all needing constant attention and involving shortage of sleep. Up to midwinter day, June 21st, 1921, meteorological observations were taken every four hours during the day. From June the 21st until December the 16th, they were taken every two hours, night and day. As Lester reflected, our days were fully occupied. Besides the ordinary work of cooking, chipping out enough frozen coal and frozen dog meat, 
clearing the hut floor and the dog boxes of a night's snow drift, searching for fresh water ice for the cooking and a score of other things that had to be done. There was, in addition to all this, the scientific work to attend to. All our writing was invariably done before supper. So a series of repetitive actions and gestures, cyclical, rhythmical, though each one was qualitatively different, depending on prevailing environmental conditions, serving to counter monotony. It is punctuality that gives authority to Bagshaw and Lester's readings. It is the sequences of plotted records that document their assiduity and exertion that renders time explicit. Read graphically, their observations reassemble the year, tracing their lived experience of duration, making evident the climatic constraints, impacts and deprivations implicit in their registration against the obligations of sustaining the human effort. Inevitably, their entries lack independent verification. Out of our purview, we take Bagshaw and Lester's word for it. Bagshaw notes, even under pleasant conditions, most of us would think twice before undertaking a set of hourly observations for a whole month, one always at work whilst the other slept. A regulated existence, void in hindsight, in hindsight by small domestic details, as when the bitch Flory stole the dinner of shag's breast and liver. After performance scholar Heathfield, A Adrian Heathfield, an incident that marked an opening of regularity to other phenomena or inchoate orders. At water, uh, water boat point, there was little privacy. Each was always aware where the other was, even if one was out of sight. They slept crammed together in a catafalque with only one metre of headroom. It was doubtless psychologically gruelling and their interactions were not always isobaric of equal pressure. But they chafed along with good humour, although occasionally at each other's expense, as when a lump of dislodged ice fell on Leicester from the waterboat ceiling, much to Bagshaw's amusement. Years afterwards, Bagshaw wrote, had either of us been addicted to melancholia, heaven knows what would have become of us. Some days have been so trying that we could easily have sat down and wept with misery and depression. But we always tried to make a joke of our troubles. Subject to self-imposed checks on behaviour, and to the curtailing of individual desires, they developed a symbiotic mode of dwelling with a degree of intimacy, becoming habituated to the dynamics of their constraints. Learning to adapt their physical decision-making, thoughts and social practices to their altered and remorselessly interdependent condition. They labored together for several weeks before winter set in, building an extension from bamboo poles covered in lifeboat sail and fixed with iron hoops salvaged from crates, strengthening the hut, stowing away provisions, stacking coal, making dog collars and kennels, noted Lester, and also articles for domestic use using bent nails from packing cases. As Lester cooked, Bagshaw changed records on the gramophone. Whilst eating in the tiny lounge, they devised a complementary arrangement, whereby we fed in turns in a sort of alternating rhythm, so as to avoid banging each other's heads together. They were aware of their shared dependence. If Lester had succumbed, I could not have faced the ghastly loneliness of being left behind, wrote Bagshaw. It was, quote, 
a test site of cultural values, an extemporary kinship predicated upon hospitality, civility and ethics developed in a fog of cigarette smoke. Their food reserves were limited to biscuits, baked beans, tinned pemmican and whiskey, although they were generally abstinent. They culled the fauna and despite being heartily sick of the restricted diet, stayed relatively healthy. Seal and penguin meat flavoured with Worcester sauce, celery seed or curry powder provided their main sustenance, leavened by a daily sweet each and copious amounts of Nestle's condensed milk. It was Lester who placed an embargo on taking penguin eggs. We were both anxious to eat them, but we felt that the scientific work should have preference. Of the 1,200 exposures made principally by Leicester, most are of the whaling adventures and, distant, uh, and of distant penguins, giving little sense of chronology. It was not encouraging taking hundreds of photographs without knowing how they were turning out, wrote Bagshaw. But in two portraits, they appeared similarly dressed in the leather one-piece flying suits they found in the deposited stores, their wild hair attesting to the passage of time. And I think we got coming up my favourite picture. I love that picture. It's just a great sort of crazy Antarctic explorer. Um, after attempting a trim with nail scissors, Lester looked like a freakish mixture of artist, poet and actor. In the images, they seemed cheerful, though life was always risky in such isolation. Fortunately, apart from Lester biting his tongue following a blow from an oar and an injury to his eye, they suffered few injuries. During preparations for winter, a bag of flour exploded, adding, in so doing, a coating of fine white powder to the veneer of seal oil, blood, smoke, penguin guano, reindeer hair and candle grease, with which we were already covered, wrote Bagshaw. His white tennis shirt became, quote, a dark khaki wreck the right sleeve held together by dirt. By the 6th of October, their last bath was 12 months previously. But there is here an incorporation of the other, as proposed by Julia Kristeva in her figuration of, ab of abjection, rather than separation from it. Only upon relief did they become conscious of their appearance. We may have even smelt. I could not tell by sniffing at Lester, for it is difficult to tell whether another person is odiferous when one is no better oneself. Their living conditions swung between not truly bad at best, to nearly unlivable at worst. The lowest temperature they experienced um, was minus, sorry, you can hear my doorbell has just rung. I am very sorry to say, and you can hear my dogs kicking off. So um, I do apologize about that. Um, their living conditions swung between not truly bad at best to nearly unlivable at worst. The lowest temperature they experienced was minus 16 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 26.6 degrees centigrade, and the yearly average was 26.1 Fahrenheit, minus 3.3 degrees centigrade. As Lester expl explained, taking a retrospective view of the weather, I'm just going to have to pause for a little minute, aren't I, to sort of
So I think it's the season of uh, deliveries, isn't it? So that's what that was. I do apologise. Right. OK. So taking a retrospective view of the weather we experienced, my impression, generally speaking, is very bad. This is Lester explaining. At no time during the year could the conditions be called very severe, but they were trying in the extreme. The very great and rapid fluctuations in temperature with the constant consequent freezing up and thawing out of everything, the almost incessant winds and overcast sky accompanied by heavy precipitation and thick weather were detrimental to our work and would prove trying to the most philosophical of minds. Everything freezes, wrote Bagshaw on the 9th of May. Tonight, my ink pot has frozen up and the mince froze as we were eating it. We sit and shiver and try to laugh at our discomforts. It's not much use to moan and groan. On the 25th of July, it was 20 degrees Fahrenheit in the bedroom, quote, not uncomfortably warm. Book pages froze together, the alarm clock refused to work and boots felt like cast iron. By the vigorous application of the hammer and some physical contortions, I managed to pull them on later in the day. A painful ordeal as they suffered chillblains as well as constant sore noses. They warmed their hands by placing them in the entrails of animals, quote, an unpleasant but effective method. The hut was dark, requiring candles night and day. It leaked incessantly, needing constant repair, particularly after sudden thaws in the wildly fluctuating temperatures. In the bedroom, breath and steam condensed and froze to the ceiling as hoarfrost before falling and leaving sleeping bags sodden. The stove was a constant headache. On the 9th of July, it took six hours to light and it only really worked in warm weather. If we shut the door completely, we were stifled by fumes. If we left it open, we were nearly frozen. In Bagshaw's view, the man who called this spot Paradise Bay should have the honour of living here. So we're moving on to a section now um, titled Materials. Expeditions of the heroic era took a finite amount of, e of equipment and stores, usually listed in the ship's manifest, along with personal belongings of crew members. This constituted what we might regard as a closed assemblage, a fixed repertoire, impossible to replenish, augmented only by elements drawn from local faunal sources and discarded materials, flotsam and jetsam, that had to be used and reused and refashioned to fulfil expeditionary imperatives or more immediate matters of survival or those of entertainment. And expeditions were inventive. Despite the formal routine set for keeping observations, this was a milieu of improvisation, of imagination, ingenuity and inventiveness, and of mutation, transformation and metamorphosis in the nature of things. Objects here uh, were employed for purposes that were never intended the Ross Sea Party used oars from the Discovery dinghy to stun seals. New objects were customised, fashioned and created from existing stores and from materials recovered from the remains of previous expeditions. However well equipped an expedition may be, there are always special arrangements and adaptations necessary to further the labour saving contrivances and extend the radius of action, wrote Frank Debenham. On Terra Nova, Edgar Evans made pony shoes from folded tin. 
based on vague ideas of our remembrance of the shoes worn for lawn mowing. Significantly, in this extreme circumstance, things circulated, slipping their classificatory order, no longer confined to their originary or ascribed identity. In forms of bricolage, in makeshift responses to an environment of limited resources, as a way of making sense with the tools to hand, their employment became fluid and provisional. They became mutable. A pea tin could turn into a blubber lamp, a cornflower crate into the binding of a book, a hank of a hawser, as we'll see, into a theatrical wig. There is here an inherent instability and potentiality in the nature and meaning of things. The mundane and disposable suddenly became significant. Anything might be pressed into service. From time to time and concurrently, any object might be variously functional or decorative, representational, fictive and or cognitive. Such occurrences problematize notions of archaeological classification based solely upon attribution to singular function. And as familiars, they become closely bound up with human aspirations, enshrining purpose, invested with hopes for successful outcomes. Um, and now the paper takes a little bit of a detour um, to talk about, um, uh, I'm just trying to find, here we go, to talk about um, Scott's expedition and their um, amateur theatricals, which is actually fascinating. Um, so, turning aside for a moment, on the 25th of June 1902 and renamed the Royal Terror Theatre, Scott's Discovery Hut opened its doors with the premiere of Ticket of Leave, a comic melodrama. There we go. Lieutenant Mick Barn painted a drop curtain depicting a blazing Mount Terror on a piece of ship's tarpaulin. On the 6th of August 1902, for the debut of the dish cover minstrel troupe, Mick Barn added a large caricatured head to the canvas. Scott notes the trouble the sailors had taken in making suits of grotesque form and vivid colours, shirt fronts and large collars from paper, enormous buttons and boots and wigs from frayed rope, all, in his words, essential parts of the minstrel's costume. Late in 1902, Barn rigged the sledge that he used to transport his scientific sounding equipment with a set of sails. He named his vessel the Flying Scud. In the photograph, it stands trimmed in front of the icebound Discovery. But there, surprisingly, on the foresail is the word theatre in big caps with traces of an erupting volcano on the rear. In searching for suitable fabric, Barn had resorted to cutting up the drop curtain of the defunct Royal Terror Theatre that he himself had painted only months before. His small act of innovation exhibits a playful creativity. The employment of the curtain is surely not by chance. He did this purposefully. His audience, his crewmates knew what he meant. They got it. So a ship's tarpaulin becomes a theatre curtain, becomes a sledge sail. And I like to imagine that if we were to examine closely the suits fashioned by the Ross Sea Party from scraps of canvas recovered from Scott's Discovery Hut, it would have, faintly now, 
a blazing volcano on the back and theatre down one leg. Bagshaw and Lester lacked, quote, a great many things of domestic nature. A saw, two geological hammers, a chisel, some pocket knives were about all we had, wrote Bagshaw. In addition, they possessed an arbitrary assortment of things, a single fork from Bagshaw's picnic sec set, but also a gramophone. So it was that the geological hammer was used to shatter the skulls of penguins, to club seals, to hack coal from the frozen pile and to nail up eider downs, though, quote, both Lester and I hammered and cut most of our fingers with their sharp edges. Bagshaw fashioned himself a two pronged fork from a packing case and used a towel as a muffler. They constructed a door with seal skin hinges from cigarette cases, a step ladder by splitting a wooden spar, a shovel out of a kerosene tin, a poker from a blubber drag iron, a hand barrow for carrying seal meat from a box, and a pemmican guillotine similar to a photographer's print trimmer from a knife. It worked very well, and the bits of pemmican no longer flew in all directions. They made a stove from an oil drum in which was placed a bucket punched with holes. This bucket, which contained the fire, gave off most of its smoke into the hut instead of up the chimney. The lack of ventilation and the absence of windows caused us to suffer from bad headaches and sore throats. They fashioned guards for sore noses from bandage and tape. They recovered the telescope from the bay using a dog bowl tied to an ice pick with a snowshoe as a landing net. They exploited resources to hand, making mittens of dog skin. And when a penguin smashed the glass of a wristwatch, which was a nuisance for it was the only ordinary watch we possessed and had been most useful to remind us of observation time, Bagshaw created a new outer case from an old toothpaste tin. Keeping to the schedule was the essence of their being. Improvisation is not just a matter of making do with anything at hand. It requires imagination to see the other in something and then the wherewithal to affect the transition. And although most conversions involve functional items, there are here small acts of playful innovation. The bamboo candle holder that surely helped to fill the time. Here, as sundry objects are thrown together in contingent groupings in which like stands adjacent to unlike in unusual, unexpected and uncanny juxtapos juxtapositions. Here, diverse things without natural affinities of origin, provenance and type are gathered in arrays found only in the bracketed, set aside, fragment of space-time that the expedition represents. Gramophone, dogskin gloves, drag iron. Here too, things have a certain independence and generative potentiality, producing effects, making things happen. The expedition as a cloistered world in which human and non-human actants, including the unintended and the abject, dirt, and disorder are assembled and equally likely to conspire mutually resonant repercussions. The boots resist the hammer. Such expedient responses and their associated activities present a museological challenge to acknowledge the fluidity and circulation, both physical and semiotic, of things and bits of things to demonstrate their potency and the role of improvisation and contingency within the restricted re repertoire. Um, 
so in this next part of the paper, I think Mike is um, starts thinking uh, through performance theory a little bit more um, and thinks it. So I've got a subheading here saying to embrace a shift from the representational to a performance mode of apprehension. So beside the closed assemblage of things, there is here a similarly closed dramatis personae. Everything that was done was achieved by two known individuals with no random presences who account for their experiences in published memoirs. Within such expeditionary practices, there is an exceptional opportunity to draw, pe draw together people, places and things and discern after Alfredo Gonzalez Ribal, the materializations of their manifold transactions. In its spareness, the scene is essentially metonymic or synec docic docic, with, few, with a few objects standing in for an absent whole, a bare outline of the vernacular complexity of everyday life elsewhere. Yet despite the paucity, the situation at Waterboat Point is perhaps akin to Tim Ingold's Ocean of Materials, quote, a flux in which materials of the most diverse kinds through processes of admixture and distillation, of coagulation and dispersal, and of evaporation and precipitation undergo continual generation and transformation. Here, any distinction drawn between people and things, I suggest, is ontologically arbitrary. At Waterboat Point, environmental conditions oscillating between acceptable, unacceptable and optimal required modification of contacts, body to scene, body to object and body to body. Here, Bagshaw and Lester faced ergonomic demands on their posture and locomotion and on their application and manipulation of things. Snow, wind and rain lashed them. Rain transformed rocks into miniature skating rinks and guano into a morass, making the short journey to take weather readings, quote, full of thrills. Through increases in hazard, stress, demand and overload, their responsive cap capacities were compromised or restricted, execution hindered or prevented, the ability to adjust effectively limited. The increased time spans needed for tasks resulted in duress and the present dangers of fire and suffocation required constant vigilance. Their methods of coping included those planned, those momentarily concocted and those informed by previous experience, and they were ever ready to improvise. Unpredictability in conditions became the catalyst for unanticipated actions, precipitating unforeseen events, accel accelerating responses as energetic interjections into the schedule. And just occasionally, as they addressed, accommodated and animated opportunities and compensated for shortfalls, their practices led to virtuosic displays of resilient resilience and inventiveness. It was through their impromptu adaptations to environment and their imp improvised things that they found affordance. As James Gibson posits, the medium, substances, surfaces, objects, places, and other animals have affordances for a given animal. They offer benefit or injury, life or death. The affordances of the environment are what it offers the animal, what it provides or furnishes, either for good or ill. And through experience, they find ways to go on. They were flexible in response, employing tools both designed and rejigged for the task, appreciating the affordances they offered, 
pushing the limits of their customary use. Objects becoming prosthetics, extending human capabilities in these extraordinary circumstances of cold and darkness. Jane Bennett suggests that non-human objects and their corresponding effects have vibrancy and vitality. The disposition, quote, not only to impede or block the will and designs of humans, but also to act as agents or forces with trajectories, propensities or tendencies of their own. They possess distinct powers and capacities of effectivity, efficacy, volition and causality. Freezing, thawing, accumulating, collapsing, metamorphosing. They can do things, make a difference and alter the course of events, disrupting, disordering, ameliorating responses. In their instability and unruliness, they may require compensatory acts, what Ian Hodder calls fixing solutions, or as before, improvisation. In Antarctica, human occupation is conditional. This is a world of doing, of making a stand, but also of being done unto and, and inevitably of being immersed, of being totally absorbed as another element of a vibrant milieu by turn benign and adverse. Bagshaw and Lester came to know the immediate terrain at the most intimate of scales as a network of places linked in their daily itineraries, as familiar nodes or as knots of activity and things, of practices and affects tied together. They became habituated through repeated constitutive acts of dwelling. In this way, Waterboat Point further resembles a miniature provisional version of Ingold's Taskscape, an ensemble of tasks with a task as a practical operation carried out by a skilled agent in an environment that only gets meaning from its position within an array of related activities in a world, quote, continually coming into being through the combined action of human and non-human agencies. In an inhabited life world, people and environment, natural and cultural phenomena, features and practices are enfolded or entangled. After archaeologist Ian Hodder, in webs of material and technical, as well as immaterial, symbolic and conceptual components, tied together in webs or networks of mutual and contingent restraints and reliances, a dialectic of dependence and dependency that creates potentials, further investments and entrapments. Two projects mark Bagshaw and Lester's capitalization upon the opportunities afforded by their confinement and their subscription to a rhythmic life as they devised activities that served to allay cabin fever. In the first, they undertook a detailed and methodical study of the breeding cycle of Gen 2 and Chinstrap penguins, marking 50 nests with numbered stones and individual eggs in Indian ink, and watching hatching hourly for 13 days uh, in December. In a second, they jerry-rigged a tide gauge made from an anchored barrel with half an oar projecting from it. The oar was calibrated. White enamel strips were painted every alternate six inches, the intervening six inches being left unpainted. Between the strips, we marked every three inch interval with a white line and divided the white strips with red lines across the center. From November the 16th, they took readings every hour for 30 days in alternating six hour watches. OK, and now we're coming to the last part of Mike's paper as he sort of sums it all up.
Eventually, the whale is collected to return them on the 13th of January, 1922, Bagshaw and Lester nailed up the hut, taking their notes and records with them, but leaving most of their meagre supplies. The expedition to Graham Land, as it became known, is often adjudged the greatest failure in the history of Antarctic exploration. According to David Day, the expedition had been a farce. It provided no headlines to stimulate British interest or activity in the Antarctic and failed to reinforce Britain's claim to other parts of the continent. Yet the unique achievements of Bagshaw and Leicester, attested in their recorded observations, have been latterly appreciated. Quote, they collected more data per man than any other expedition until the advent of computers and satellites. Though Bagshaw did not publish his study of penguins until 1938, a narrative monograph and observational appendices until 1939, and an illustrated children's book in 1940. But there is something else here beyond scientific rationale and apologia to which Lester, albeit inadvertently, alludes. We spent a year and a day at our base, Water Boat Point, and therefore experienced a complete cycle of the weather conditions. There is a commitment to time, to completing tasks against time, to fulfilling schedules, however arduous, to intensifications of attention rather than attention-seeking heroics in isolation as profound as that of space exploration, to making do through improvisation. We might best regard and describe Bagshaw and Lester's exploits at Waterboat Point through the notion of symmetry, an analytical level leveling of people and things in a field of distributed agencies that offers no particular primacy to any particular component, stressing rather flows of interplay between things and the effects and affects engendered in their dynamic contacts. This approach recognises, quote, the varied qualities always possessed by things and thus the radical differences they make to the world, both among themselves and to humans. In a terrain with specific attributes, the two men, as features and functions of the ecosystem, were not separate from the things they used and made, consumed and discarded. They arrived as an alien species rather than as heroic conquerors, though it is doubtful whether they ever upset the ecological balance or in the realm of the leopard seal that they became top predator. As Bjorn Olsen notes, Snow, ice, wind, sea and penguins existed and interacted in, in, an art, in Antarctica prior to being encountered by humans. And surely they continue to do so in their absence. We might apprehend their venture as figures in or of the landscape through pragmatology, what Martin Holbrad calls a thing centric discipline but with pragmata, as Michael Shanks notes, including deeds, acts, things done, doings, circumstances, encounters, contested matters, duties or obligations. As Shanks observes, the verb at the root of pragmata is pratein, to act in the material world, engaged with things. The task surely now becomes, after Jane Bennett, to identify the contours of the swarm and the kind of relations that obtain between its bits, beginning in media race in the thick of things. From this perspective, can our critical scrutiny include both things, bodies, species, objects, phenomena, sensations, and things done, as well as the impacts, effects, and experiences generated in their manifold articulations.
And this shift to a less anthropocentric perspective might prompt us to reframe historical and archaeological scrutiny and approaches within museology, to reconsider approaches to classification based solely upon conventional attribution, to challenge ordering upon assumed function. Of what type is a geological hammer when cracking a seal's skull or softening a boot? From prime concentration on the heroic human subject to closer consideration of contributory factors of environmental constituents and the nature and role of things. To take cognizance of all that is operating to what is doing what at any one time in a specific context. Of the ways in which prevailing conditions mediate an impact upon activities offering both constraint and opportunity. How things have agency, possessing unique properties and propensities for engendering sensual, visceral and emotional impacts. And how the explorers exhibit the symptoms of their engagement. How things themselves perform anonymously, irrespective of human presence. In an examination of the relationship between material culture and human behaviour, we might even reveal inarticulate, unregarded or disregarded practices, anonymous, silent, silenced, suppressed, forgotten, ignored, the minstrel show. It might challenge familiar categorizations through the identification of shortcuts, transgressions um, and acts of trespass that privileged the makeshift over the planned, highlighting instances of personal enterprising, enterprise, leading to a fuller appreciation of the micro chronologies and polyphonic geographies that make up the expeditionary experience, making connections as at the scene of the crime where anything, everything in the first instance could be significant. Just coming to a close here now. Bagshaw and Lester survived for a year on the edge of the known world, on the edge of an unknown continent, often on the edge, improvising a, uh, a life of fulfilled schemes and of misfires, improvising relationships with things, imagining them to have capacities in momentary usages, hammer the boot in planned projects, cut and bend the kerosene, kerosene can, beyond their conventional ascription. With Waterboat Point as a topological space in which materials, bodies and things undergo continuous deformations, intermingling and reformations. And perhaps such improvisation, and I'm now going to use the B word, bricolage, is always a feature of life on the edge a deep appreciation of the potential of materials and of things and of what they might become. Um, thank you very much. That is the end of Mike's keynote talk today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Leslie. That was a brilliant keynote speech, so thank you very much. And I'm sure Mike would be pleased with the, with what you were saying. Loads of themes there, loads of themes there, which are going to be developed over the next couple of days. But um, I think now I'll hand you or hand the conference over to panel one, which is going to be Islands at the Edge of Modernity. But thanks a lot, Leslie, that was brilliant. <laughs> Hello, I'm just uh, hoping that someone could confirm that you can hear me OK. Hi, but I can't see you. 
Okay. Right, just give me a second. I can see and hear you, Matt. Ah, that's good. Thank you. But unfortunately, you can you can't see the correct screen at the moment, so I'm just trying to get back out when I'm in. Um, OK. I'm just opening the sharing tray. <laughs> I take it, Peter and Andrew, you can't see the, project, the PowerPoint yet, no? No, but I think it may be coming. Here we are, got it, yes. Oh, it's on the screen. That's excellent, that's excellent. Just give me a second, I'll just make it full screen. Or perhaps not. Oh, there we are. Can you tell me whether that's full screen? It's full enough. I've got a side screen as well, but it's fine by me. OK. I'm just now trying to see if the slides will change as well, but apparently not. Ah. There we are. I think I can change the slides. My apologies for that. I hope everybody can see me OK. Andrew, if you could, you're on the screen just now. If you could just give me a thumbs up. Excellent. Okay, okay. Well, welcome to panel one. My name is Matt Sillers, and I've been teaching for many years on the culture and heritage degree at the University of the Highlands and Islands, and my research interests are in visual sociology and visual research methods. And the module which I have been teaching mostly on focuses on the way in which representation in Scotland occurs through photography. And my colleagues today are uh, Emeritus Professor Andrew Blakey from Aberdeen, who has written extensively on the way in which photography and the visual influence culture and cultural identity, namely books such as The Scots Imagination and Modern Memory and Visual Narratives of the 20th Century Framing Modern Scotland and also How to See the Highlands, the Emerging Ecology of the Scottish Field. Andrew has written heavily on picture post and the way in which photography from the 1940s, 50s, 60s has been very influential in the way we understand and construct our, our, our representation of Scotland. My other colleague is Dr Peter Moore from Scottish Natural Heritage. Peter is a policy and advice officer who has worked extensively on St Kilda and in the Western Isles since 1986. He is also based in the Cairngorms currently. His research is in the social science discipline. Radio breaking up. Oh, uh, hopefully people can hear me okay. His research focuses on tourist related photography and in particular something known in the trade as re-photography, which is the photographing of photographs which have already been taken. So Peter spends time in the environment looking at landscape change and exploring the way in which images allow us to understand the change which has taken place. This panel, we're going to divide it up into three sections. Andrew is going to lead off. Peter will then follow and I will be at the tail end and we'll be able to open up to questions afterwards. Thank you. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Matt. I hope everyone can hear me. I had some uh, problems with you early on, but it seems to have uh, rectified itself. I am interested in <clears throat> the historical relationships between if the edge is about boundaries and demarcation, 
then perceptions of the Atlantic periphery pivot around a series of binaries created via a modern, by which I mean post-1750 mindset, a modern vision. So we have, for example, uh, the modern against the ancient, civilized against primitive, us against them, outsider, insider, central, marginal, and so on. Those looking, those looked at. These ways of seeing have frame a, framed a photographic vision that's been highly ethnological in character. In other words, to a large extent over this period, islands and islanders were regarded by, as by definition other, in other words, as exotic peripheral cultures, therefore worthy of anthropological interpretation, and with that, all the theoretical uh, and hermeneutic baggage of anthropology or ethnology, uh, sort of study of bunk culture, if you will. Yet against this, the lived experience of Islanders, as emphasized genealogical continuity. So if we look there's as much reckoning of kin, place names, social memory making. So how might we try to get some perspective on these rather different worldviews? One way might be through the concept of the inside, we meet them, etc. Such points of focus could act as potentials for unlocking the past, or at least that's the, the hope, if you will. In terms of research into photography and photographers, we can consider such specific elements as thresholds, actual doorways, windows, or more broadly, such things as the contrast between landscapes and interiors. So, Andrew, Matt, excuse have me. The first slide, please. Andrew, excuse me, can you just drop your video and just see if we can get a better signal? There's a little bit of breakup in your presentation and delivery. Sorry, I can't hear you, Pete. <laughs> OK, uh, there's a little bit of breakup in your presentation delivery. I just wonder if you can drop your video and just see if we get a better bandwidth on it. I'll try, but then I won't be able to see myself. that any better? I think it possibly could be, yeah. Just stick with that if you can. OK, that's fine. I'm happy with that. Um, if we take, for example, Paul Strand's photographs of crofters outside their homes, what do these poses tell us about these people? Indeed, what do they tell us about the photographer, Paul Strand? What were his intentions and why? How is this picture framed? Um, Matt, if I could see slide two, please. Yeah, here's another um, Paul Strand picture. We have to ask ourselves, looking at this picture, I think, what lies behind the stare of this man who looks out at us? What's going on? He's also framed in a doorway, again, a threshold, um, a point of contact between the interior, the exterior, between them and us. During the early and mid 20th century, photographers like M. E. M. Donaldson, an eccentric gentlewoman who trolled about Ardnamurchan and elsewhere with her equipment in a converted pram, romanticized people and places while berating all incursions of modernity, seeing things as, such as tarred roofs or corrugated iron and so forth as, quote, synonymous with irredeemable ugliness. So a vision is in many ways typical of a reflection upon a perceived Celtic twilight, one that was also criticised by both insiders and outside observers. You know, we could look, for example, at um, poets like McDermott and McNeese, whose writings, more like travel writings on their various sojourns, um, criticise the romantic view, but also accommodate it to some extent, or Alexander Alpin McGregor, uh, and his fight with the Stornoway Press. If you want to know more about photographers of the Western Isles, see Martin Paget's excellent book of the same name. 
if we fast forward to the 21st century and look at what's been going on much more recently, we have works like Becca Globes on threshold places or Alex Boyd's, the ubiquitous Alex Boyd's St Kilda, the Silent Island, touted as, quote, vigilant against nostalgia and ruin lust. A very different take, but the tropes remain the same. It's within the same overall um, package of metaphors. Many have gone through the keyhole, as it were, across the threshold and into the interior. Can I have slide three, please? Many of you will be familiar with this. It's John Mayer's uh, from his Nobody's Home exhibition. Here, the wallpaper, dresser and easy chair of a recent past within the deserted crop, but also the modern TV set itself an aperture, a means of, of entry into a, into a wider cultural world. The such interior images indicate trespass, though, on another culture, particularly going into ruined homes that still have people's household gods within them. Do they indicate trespass or simply curiosity? Moira McLean, who also visits abandoned croft houses, has in her artistic quest deemed herself a wallpaper pirate as she mines domesticity as memory. In the 1950s, photojournalists tried to shine a light on Hebridean life, quite literally by using windows as portals. We can see on slide four, If you look, for example, um, at, the, at these two pictures, um, it, it suggests the real difficulties of interpretation, uh, even within the, the works of, a, of, of one photographer on one particular photo shoot. Vividly portrayed here, I think, in the juxtaposition of images. If you look at the top photo, uh, the man at the fishing nets, his wife at the spinning wheel, dark lighting, uh, a seemingly traditional interior in keeping with photography, which accentuates difference, otherness, a past looking view. Then look at the bottom picture, uh, a much more contemporary, at least for 1955, family at leisure. Now, looking at these two together, it's difficult to grasp that the two photographs show the same couple in the same home on the same day. Um, we find similar contrasts looking at, for example, interiors uh, between tradition and modernity in the work of Gus Wiley, his shots, for example, of teenagers' bedrooms, or Chick Chalmers, or Tom Kidd, indeed, in the, in the Shetland. Finally, if we could look at slide five, here's a rather grainy image by Dan Morrison, an indigenous Lewis man um, from Ness. As the caption reminds us, here are men gathered in a drinking body, confined in a tight local space. Yet the photographer's focus belies the fact that, quote, the men in the bottom sailed the seven seas. Ness, their community, lay at the edge of the world. On one level, this image contains these people as a community or as members of a community or as members of a, a group of men in a specific place. And yet at the same time, it disguises their dispersion across the globe. For as Morrison's text says, uh, the men would have sailed the seven seas. Every week, money earned on the Clyde or the prairies boosted the local economy. So Ness is a place at the edge of the world where people are both contained uh, in the photograph, uh, in the, the, the vision, if you like, as being very much pe people who are members of a, an isolated community. And yet, if we go further into the biographies of these individuals, we find that they're dispersed across a much wider world. So how does photography capture that um, way of life? How does photography capture the vision of people looking out? How do people looking in capture that vision? So I've suggested uh, very briefly here, but just as a starter, that we might think of the idea of portals, thresholds, doorways, windows, the point at which the inside meets the outside. Thank you for listening.
Okay, Matt, shall I just ping on? I was just trying to find my mute button there because it's hidden behind various screens now. But thank you very much. I'll hand over to, to Peter Moore, Pete Moore. Thanks, Matt. Um, just having sort of established the the the, the fizzog on the on the screen, I'm going to drop the camera again. Uh, I think it seemed to work well for for Andrew's presentation, and got, we've got a clear narrative on that. So, um, if you can move to the next slide, please, Matt, and I'm just going to drop my screen. Okay, so I'm just going to. I've selected four images to sort of throw some thoughts around. Um, yeah, they're all taken in the Outer Hebrides over a period of the last, 50, oh, oh, sorry, not the last, over a period of about 50 years, 52 years, I think. From top left, these photographs are the St Kilda Parliament, photographed by Norman MacLeod for the George Washington Wilson Studio in 1886. Top right, Finley McQueen catching puffins, photographed on Borre St Kilda by Cherry Kitten in 1896. Uh, bottom left, native dwelling interior, photographed by Robert Moyes Adam in 1905. And then finally, Mrs. Gillis spinning outside number 11, photographed by Robert Atkinson in 1938. My interest in research kind of it, it really examines the usual evidential content of the photograph, uh, but also considers the implied and coded interpretations. But I seek to add to that where possible with the temporal experience gained by revisiting the vantage point from which the photograph was made. Um, and I kind of look in at ideas about the development of tourism uh, and environmental change. And recently I've been thinking about these and others in the context of McCannell's concept of staged authenticity. I'll have the next slide, please, Matt. So the St Kilda Parliament is not the earliest of the St Kilda documentaries, but it is a photograph that has come to encapsulate the islands. The photograph was actually made by Norman MacLeod, who is really given credit that he deserves for his work. His output is synonymous, of course, with the studio of his employer, George Washington Wilson. Uh, MacLeod toured the Highlands in 1885 with Wilson and undoubtedly learned his trade and learned his skills from him. And in 1886, he went to St Kilda and made a small iconic series of photographs, including this one. The capture was made on the village street and is clearly choreographed. The Parliament of St Kilda was first described as such by the journalist John Sands in his book of 1878. And so the arrangement of the photograph is likely to be the result of MacLeod interpreting a narrative title and so doing firmly establishing what is called so-called Parliament look like. It was never captured again with native St Kildans, um, but it's oft replicated by subsequent visitors. And I'm just going to I'm just going to kind of bin that one as, as uh, I've got time to go down that particular rabbit hole. But there's an interesting kind of reconstruction, re reimagination, reperformance that has happened over many years. There's a care and arrangement and positioning of this group uh, by both the photographer and also the actors taking part. The two men nearest the camera on each side are wearing their brogues while the others, more distantly, are barefoot, as they would normally have been. Dogs have been banished, women also. The gazes are directed, neutral, relaxed, attentive. Uh, and it's interesting to speculate whether there was any transaction involved to encourage this performance, and indeed whether MacLeod perhaps had a smattering of Gaelic and could communicate more easily. It's also possible that in terms of photography, he was simply early enough in the St Kilda timeline that visitor fatigue had not gripped the population. The photograph did what we would now be described as going viral. It was widely distributed, enduring well into and beyond the golden age of postcards, selling on the passenger cargo steamers that plied the Hebridean route and from the St Kilda post office up until the evacuation in 1930. It became influential and has remained emblematic of St Kilda. One of the men included in the image is Finley McQueen, champion cragsman of St Kilda. Next slide, please, Pat. And 10 years after MacLeod's visit, Finley collaborated with the Kirton brothers on their visit to St Kilda. Their relationship was undoubtedly reasonably personal. And Kirton refers to the supply of tobacco and sweets and smooth, it's a way of smoothing some of his photography. 
Whereas MacLeod was treated to visit Sack and Armin, the Kirtans were taken to Bodore and Soe. Both photographers on these separate expeditions only managed a couple of exposures on these remote locations. And these are difficult places to reach and move about, move kit about, photographic kit, even now. In this view, we have a bearded native, a fouling device, and a carpet of apparently confiding puffins. The image is powerful documentary of the time, undoubtedly contrived, but also authentic. Was it made to document? Was it made to shock? Was it received with dismay, intrigue, or pity when published? Certainly now it can be loaded with judgment when viewed through a 21st century lens with a declining seabird population. Have the next slide, please, Matt. I had the opportunity to visit Bodore a couple of years ago, um, counting seabirds, and was able to track down Kirtan's vantage point clearly located by the stones in the foreground. What is most obvious in this image is that there are no puffins evident. Have the next slide, please, Matt. The Kittens reported that Angus Gillis, another of their cragsman acquaintances on the islands, once bagged no less than 620 puffins in a single day. They later quoted the aforementioned Sands, who calculated 89,600 puffins had been killed in the year 1876. These are huge numbers set against unknown scales of population. And it's probably, too, well, it is too simple to conclude that the St Kildan set the downward spiral of puffin numbers. There are so many factors in play. But to briefly summarize my examination of this, Kitten's photograph appears to show roughly 335 puffins. Now, he had a few decoys in there as well, but we'll just go with roughly 335 puffins. With my own camera at the vantage point, I marked and counted the visible area within his frame and found 139 burrows, of which only 29 appeared to be occupied. There is some sustained use of the birds in that area, but it seems also possible that their behavior and distribution locally has changed. And I, I can come back to a bit of that if, if, if necessary. Next slide, please, Matt. Jumping forward nine years, Robert Moyes Adam is on Mingale. Typically, Adam sought new locations and angles for his photography. And on Mingale, he found an untainted seabird eating community, which was far less known than the St Kildans, and remained unexploited by tourism. Adam's approach was different. Both MacLeod and the Kirtons stayed in the Factor's house on St Kilda, separated, aloof, one might call it, from the islanders. After a few days of camping on Mingale, Adam was able to, quote unquote, take lodgings in a black house with John McLean, his wife and two young daughters. Although in the parlance of the time, Adam's perception of the arrangement is perhaps portrayed by his clinical anthropological description of the image as a native dwelling interior. His relationship with McLean, John McLean, at the island is undoubtedly, the islander is undoubtedly personal and they kept in touch for years afterwards. Among a wonderful selection of images of the island and its wildlife, this is the first capture by anyone of the inside of a black house. It demonstrates the, the relationship formed, the intimacy, possibly an air of deference, afforded to Adam. And technically, though, this demonstrates Adam's mastery of the photographic process. It is right on the edge of the limitation. The image shows both practical decoration, newspapers as wallpaper, drafts, and pride in the extremely basic home, the carefully cut newspaper adorning the mantelpiece to look like lace work. This picture with the ghostly presence of the McLean children by the window was never published. A view of Adam's Mingale landscape pictures was also used to illustrate agricultural features many years after they were taken. But I would speculate that the location, Mingale, did not find the same, same level of distribution afforded to the other island photographers. On the topic of performance, Adam's photographs of fowling, catching birds taken on Mingale, 
feature his brother and a friend as actors in the photographs. This was due to the fact that at the time, many of the island men spent their days fishing, which was a forewarning of the evacuation that took place a few years later from Mingale, evacuation of the population. Just to note, there is no disclosure of that replacement of the actors, and equally nothing to suggest that it was pivotal in the photograph not finding the same type of market as um, McLeod's St Kilda ones. Ne next slide, please, Matt. So what can we learn from visiting the space? Earlier this year, I visited Mingale and the house in which Adam stayed. It remains relatively low key, the island remains relatively low key and difficult of access. It's a specialized venue, perhaps frequented mainly by climbers and bird watchers. All the houses have tumbled and many have been partially reclaimed by drifting sand. Next slide, please, Matt. It's increasingly difficult to make any sense of these ruins, but the contrast is dramatic. My camera here is occupying the same space as Adams about 115 years later. And one thing that is very clear is that it's an incredibly small space for the, for the, and for the number of people who were living there with Adam and crew involved. But it strikes me that taking of such lodgings was either a result of either an extremely hospitable and generous host or a significant financial transaction. Next slide, please, Matt. Finally, Mrs Gillis. Anne Gillis had a complex relationship with tourism over the years. She featured in McLeod's 1886 photographs of St Kildans and over the next decades as photography became more prolific on the island. Her very existence took on a lucrative monetary value with a charge being levied for the taking of photograph alongside the more routine sales of socks, gloves or shawls. Beyond the evacuation, her role in island tourism was further confirmed when she returned to the islands for several weeks in the summers before the war along with her son, Neil, and with Finley McQueen, in his then, by then in his late 70s. The photographer Robert Atkinson was an affable visitor in 1938, who undoubtedly engaged with the islanders on level terms and won their trust. Notwithstanding a certain trade in tobacco and sweets, which was influenced by the Kirtons, his reading of the Kirtons book, um, Atkinson stayed in the Factors House on St Kilda and seems to have been uh, by financial arrangement with the owners of the island, not with the islanders themselves. Atkinson was sufficiently familiar to be able to document Mrs Gillis in several poses outside her door. It was the role she played for decades previously, and indeed did that during the 1930s with the, the steamship visits. And the view is familiar from her early captures uh, and the moving image and the moving images that have been taken of St Kilda as well. In, Adam's in, in Atkinson's photographs, there is a hint of a smile can be found on her normally st stern face. Next slide, please, Matt. And just finally, uh, just a, 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 another kind of retake uh, in a slightly different style, but my retake in, 19, in 2005 um, and the surrounding contextual photographs were all made from Atkinson's vantage point. This is the National Trust Work Party working on stabilising number 11, St Kilda Street, and the montage creates just a visual conundrum between the theatre of 1930s tourism and the veneration of a simple dwelling now attracts as part of, of, part of what I would call St Kilda's preservation tourism. I'm going to leave it at that, Matt, and I will come back to anything later on. Thank you. I'll just switch my microphone on there. Things take a little bit longer. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, we're running quite tight for time because of the slight uh, hiccup at the very beginning. I won't take very long and that hopefully will leave some space for any questions which have been placed into the into the chat box. My, I'm just trying to get the slide to change. Here we are. I'm going to be focusing very briefly on something which has been introduced really by Pete already, the idea of the George Washington Wilson Company and the work of Norman MacLeod, particularly in the way in which the construction of identity and the understanding of people was um, 
to, to a great extent demonstrated by things such as lantern slideshows, which were put around the entire UK, shown to church groups, to local community groups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these came not only with images, but they came with text as well. And the Road to the Isles, the Hebridean lantern slides, was a very famous slideshow which was produced by the George Washington Wilson Company in 1885 and featured the work of Norman MacLeod, the photographer. To uh, sociologically, key things which I am interested in and which I like to, to try to uh, you know, sort of explore the images and text with in order to illustrate the way in which representation is created can really be, I suppose, defined by these key terms here. The way in which Victorian uh, people, I switch my, my camera off just in case that makes things a wee bit better. Maybe our camera's off now. May, may help the, the speech quality. The Victorian conceit of the civilising and improving discourse, you know, bringing civilization to the uncivilised. And Paget's work, which was mentioned earlier on by Andrew, explores this way in which internal colonialism may be operating between the, the, the anglicised core and, and the peripheral. The romantic gaze, the romantic tradition of understanding people who are not as civilised um, in your own discourse. Also, the way in which the sublime operates, the way in which the past is venerated and the way in which the past is considered to be enormous, the distance between now and then absolutely huge and therefore the, the living representations of the past are things which are stultified, which are kept in its position. Through all of that is this very interesting sociological concept of essentialism, the idea that we can create or we can find essential characteristics which define us and them, which create the difference between us and them, the creation of groups through essential characteristics, which of course is about this process of othering. And I'm fascinated by Edward Said's work in Orientalism and how the Orientalist approach can be used to explore the general creation of difference between groups. Part of that uh, othering process in Orientalism is the creation of the passive person that is being looked at and the active person who is doing the looking. So therefore, these things are discursively framed. And finally, there's the absence of the actual reality of life, the way in which the Highland clearances are not considered within the photography or within the text, but a different way of looking at peasant and a different way of looking at native is created. So here are some... Oops. Yeah, here are some photographs from the lanterns show. And of course, these are hand coloured images. So the lantern slides were, were hand produced, uh, hand coloured and packaged and sent out with text. Although from this, this image is from Sky, you know, the, the focus of this was really the Western Isles properly, but, uh, but this is this, uh, the text that goes along with this very famous image from the Lantern Slideshow, I think really highlights the way in which the construction of identity and the construction of representation is being made by the George Washington Wilson Company. So we've got this very, very, um, very powerful, very interesting image. The photograph really does uh, inform us about particular things in particular ways. We are looking upon people in a very particular way. And the text, which will be read out at the same time, contains these key phrases and these key elements. So, for example, here we discover that the Highland mainland and, of course, the, 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 the other aspects of the Highlands are no less primitive. The the Highlander uses a particular spade that is an indication of poverty. And then the, the third paragraph here, a little more energetic cultivation on their part may actually create something a bit more. So therefore the, the Islander is, is, is framed as being less energetic, as being less active, as being less um, uh, capable of looking after their own, their own lives. The haste and hurry of the 19th century has not yet taken hold. So the idea of they are not modern, they are not like us, is being created very, very powerfully here. They take everything very easily. And the final statement here, it is unusual for them to commence working until three or three and a half hours after sunrise. But to give them all credit, 
ironically, they will work as long as they can see. So the juxtaposition of this text with this image really does place the people who are in the photograph as being not like us, but other. So therefore, the idea of the civilising discourse becomes really quite important here. However, I'm also very interested in the work of photographers who are based in the communities who made their living from photographing the people in the places and selling photographs to them. So the classic wedding photographer, the portrait photographer, the person who had a photography shop on the street corner. And Inverness provides us with some quite interesting photography um, from the kind of turn of the century. And from the Andrew Patterson collection, which is online, we have a photograph of Miss Jenny Myrtle in 1925. And I think this photograph really does show that edge of modernity between the 1885 photographs of the Road to the Isles and the 1920s. We have this dramatic visual representational shift. We have here that people are being, de being portrayed as confident, as dynamic, as engaging with modernity and in no way cut off or different. Now we may argue that Inverness is part of that cosmopolitan core and that the periphery that people consider is still quite different. But these images are replicated in the Thurzo collections, are replicated in collections in Taikershkovig. So these types of images are indeed to be found in many, many parts of, of the Highlands. So we have here someone who is wearing clothing of the motor car era. So demonstrating their engagement with contemporary life with vigour. Andrew Patterson started his photography very early and we can see in the left an early photograph, an early carte de visite or cabinet card produced by Andrew Patterson. So from 1897 to 1925 we can see this dramatic shift in representation which we think really does demonstrate this islands at the edge, the idea that communities are evolving, communities are changing but also modes of representation are changing, the way in which people take control of their own photographic image is really very important there. So we've only got a couple of minutes left before the session finishes, so we're happy to, to open open um, the floor up to questions. The only problem is I'm not actually very sure how to get back to the chat box, <laughs> so give me a second and I'll see if I can click a few buttons. Oh, there we are, I seem to have made it to the chat box. So I don't know if there are any questions in here, uh, I'm just going to have a have a scroll. Oh, there's a lot of text, a lot of text from people. Uh, Joe, Joe, is it possible to maybe switch microphones on for the, the, the people in the, in, in, the, in the conference and perhaps people could ask questions if they have any, because there does seem to be quite a lot of text here. I think we're fairly clear of questions. Yeah, mics Matt. are now enabled. Thank you, Joe. Does anybody have any questions they would like to ask either Andrew, Peter or myself? I have, I have one comment, Mark, and Matt, not rather than a question. I, I think it's a fascinating talk, so thank you all. Um, I'm reminded um, with one of Pete's comments there um, about, you know, in the fashion of the grand tours of the Highlands and Islands, when people just, they used to, Boswell and Johnson move around and impose themselves on people when they turned up and be fed and whatnot. There's a wonderful quote for one of them who arrived in Sutherland and squatted on the on the on the householder and then was fed and watered and whatnot, and then wrote some really quite nasty words about the drafty rooms and the quality of food, etc. And the editor of the of the of the book said, when a footnote, let it be known that the, that the barbarian he talked about spoke seven languages fluently. Well, the visitor had only one, and that poorly. <laughs> so the the, que the question of perceptions and and uh, who is the who is the, the sophisticated is is quite interesting, and it comes across really well in some of your photographs. So thank you. Thank you. Could I just um, chip in here? Um, Paul Strand's quite interesting in that there are images of him with a tribe bob that were taken by I think his 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 wife him 
a photograph of the photographer lining up the subjects. Um, but actually, there's also um, good material from some of those people who were photographed in the 50s who have subsequently been uh, interviewed about the experience. Um, if you, there's a BBC Alapa programme that actually covers that, which adds yet another layer of photographic, photographic meaning. So, you know, it's worth sort of um, trying to get below the layers of meaning uh, when, you know, you mentioned the uh, experience of Boswell and Johnson and others and how they, uh, how they perceive people and how others have perceived them. Um, I think we can get below quite a lot of that. So beyond the actual image, if you like, to what was going on. And uh, Pete's talked quite a bit about St Kilda. Uh, there's a lot about the final evacuation of St Kilda, which is fascinating, um, some of which was um, very much suppressed by the government at the time. Yeah, there's one there's one comment in the box just about the the strict hierarchy in the village street. Um, Daniel Lee had heard that there was a, a strict hierarchy in the village street photographs and McLeod's and killed a parliament one. And I was kind of alluding to that a little bit just in terms of the, the fact that there was there was actually several arrangements going on. There was the there was the interpretation of the of the narrative and killed a parliament. There was the arrangement of the people by the photographer. Uh, presumed to their affection, but there was also the arrangement by the actors in their own sort of hierarchy or whatever else, and, and in terms of um, states and completeness or, 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 or additions to dress, uh, which I thought was quite interesting. I mean, there's, there's a whole kind of the whole kind of bit in that photograph anyway. Where, you know, without the time, we can't go into it. But yeah, uh, Andrew, there's a, a question in the chat box about the photographs by Paul Strand's wife, and do you know where these are accessible? I'm not sure if you mentioned where they could be seen. Um, not offhand. Um, the, the Paul Strand archive is um, kept by Aperture in New York, but you may find some of those images even on Scran. I can't. I can't recall exactly where those images are from. I'd also refer you to. Um, Martin Paget's book, Photographers of the Western Isles, which I think has one of their one of uh, those images. Uh, th uh, yep, yeah, that's up. Thank, thank you, thank you, says Katrina. <laughs> thank you. Yes, and Frank's come in with the uh, the the, the um, photo archives and local historical societies. I think Scran has has digitised many of those, so a lot of them are available are available online now. Well, thank you very much. That seems to be the end of the questions, and I didn't realise that Joe had said we could extend a little bit longer because the chat box wasn't available to me as I was presenting. But that's us at eleven thirty three, and I appreciate people will be going for a, a comfort break before the next part of the session. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark.
Hi, Ian. Hi, Colin. Still got the shirt on then. Well, I, I thought it's uh, appropriate. It's just so miserable here that um, I really would like to be in the second. Hi, so folks. We are, still, we are still being recorded. People yeah. can still see us just to let. Um, but yes, um, Ian, absolutely at 11.45, just jump straight in. And we'll yep. talk back. Um, <coughs> everyone can currently turn on their camera but can't turn on their microphones. Um, and during the QA, I will. Enable them to turn on their microphones. Fantastic, Joe. Thanks very much. Um, Mari, are you there? Yeah, sorry, I've got uh, builders in, so I just went down to see how they were getting on and <laughs> I've come back upstairs. Sorry. No worries, that's absolutely fine. We've got a couple of minutes yet, so oh, okay. no, no panic at all. Yeah, just need to remember that share window thing. Yeah, for the PowerPoint, I. Yeah. And is it just the two two speakers? Yes, that's right. It's a, okay. it's an hour long session. Um, so 20 minutes each. Colin, well, and I've, then I've not timed mine, and this is the thing. Um, but I keep I will keep an eye on the time. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll I'll be keeping an eye on the time too, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> we have got an hour to fill though, Ian. Um, I, I took slides out of mine and then I practiced it this morning and I was like way faster than I thought and then so I put them back in, but we'll see how we go. So that that's fine. I want I want to give people um time to time to ask questions. I'm sure there'll be loads. I'll be as flexible as I can within reason. Mine's quite um, light, <laughs> but that's okay, isn't it? It's fine. This is only a conference after all. Ha 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 ha. Well, so far so good, actually. Did you hear Mike? Did you hear Leslie reading Mike's paper? Yeah? It's good, wasn't it? It was excellent. Yes, Colin. Yeah, very good indeed. I'm totally obsessed with Arctic exploration. I literally just finished Madhouse at the end of the Earth. I don't know if you've read that, but yeah, yeah, it's kind of like an obsession of mine. So I was like, oh, this is handy. <laughs> it's It was the kind of paper I think I'd like to read as well as listen to, to tell you the truth. He, he actually gave a, um, a paper a good 20 years ago, actually, on Scott, on the hut, the Scots hut, and uh, actually drew out a lot of that stuff because that, that's all he talked about in the in the lecture. So he drew, he drew that out more and um, it, was, it was really interesting. But the great thing about Mike was when he used to go to these archaeology conferences, he completely um, traumatised the audience <laughs> on the number of the archaeologists there anyway, which is always good. Um, Colin and Mari, before we start, and, and we are now at 11.45, um, I see that Jeanette has, um, has has raised a hand. Jeanette, at the moment, um, participants, um, attendees are um, are muted. If you want to, if you have a question and you, you, you want to put it in the chat, that is probably the best way um, to, to, to get folks to pick it up, um, whether it's a technical one or, or something for our, our presenters. If you pop it in the chat, that, that will work well. Thank you. OK, folks, um, it's 11.46 according to, to my um, clock. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll make a start. It's good. It's good to try to keep to time as much as we can. Um, so I'd like to welcome people. Um, back after a coffee and comfort break to um, the EDGE conference and to this um, first uh, session of um, our post-coffee um, conference um, it, called Connected by the Sea. And um, in this session, we have two papers. And um, my plan is to, um, to run this 
um, to run the paper sequentially and then have time for um, uh, questions afterwards. If you want to pop questions into the chat box as we go along, that's fantastic. And we'll pick up those at the end of the session, as I say, um, but also um, mics will be enabled at the end of um, the, the two papers to enable us to um, take your your questions directly. So I hope that's all clear. And um, without further ado, we'll we'll begin. Um, and as I say, we have two papers today. The first is by um, Professor Colin Richards from um, UHI. And Colin is Professor of Nautical Antiquities at the University of Highlands and Islands, as I say, at the Archaeology Institute in Orkney. Before moving to UHI, Colin was Professor of World Prehistory at the University of Manchester, specialising in European, Neolithic and Polynesian archaeology. He has undertaken numerous research projects from Indonesia through to um, Northern Europe. And in Britain, he's conducted archaeological fieldwork um, at sites and monuments, including Stonehenge, Ireland, and the Western and Northern Islands of Scotland. Colin has also co-directed two major field projects um, in East Polynesia on Rapa Nui, Easter Island, and the Cook Islands, published widely in these areas, including five monographs, the most recent being Monuments in the Making, Raising the Great Dolmen in Early Neolithic Northern Europe, and that was published this year. Uh, so today, though, Colin is returning to um, Easter Island and picking up the theme, looking in from the edge. Why do the statues of Rapa Nui face inland? Rethinking interfaces, membranes and wrapping in East Polynesia. Colin. Thank you, Ian. Can you see the, the PowerPoint OK? Fantastic. OK, well, uh, we're going to go uh, to the other side of the world, away from a bleak northern Scotland as it is today. And uh, we're going to look at Rapa Nui, Easter Island, and as I say, looking at the statues. Uh, a lot of this work that I'm drawing on or allowed us to be there was a large project and uh, a HRC funded project which finished in 2015. I think the thing to um, to stress is just how vast the Pacific is and uh, the Polynesian Triangle sits quite happily in, in the middle. You have Western Polynesia, you have Samoa and Tonga and you have Hawaii in the north, you have New Zealand in the south and right at the eastern tip you have Rapa Nui and basically it's there's lots of debate about when it was first colonized. It's very difficult to establish earliest dates for colonization. You have to hit, be lucky and hit early settlements. But it seems now to, we people seem to agree that it was settled between something like AD 1100 and 1200. This is consistent with New Zealand and a lot of the expansion across the Pacific. I guess the, the, the thing to bear in mind here is this is a vast area which, for want of a better word, was colonized over a comparatively small period of time. And it's one of those extraordinary achievements, if you like, this, this great age of Polynesian voyaging. Rapa Nui is really quite small. Um, as you can see, it's, it's, it's what, 16 by eight, 16 by eight kilometers. And the, the, again, this is, this is sort of by the way, really is that you have this sort of huge expansion and these voyaging canoes going out from different islands in East Polynesia, many of which would just just carry on this because the thing is, they say uh, Rapa Nui marks the easternmost point of the Polynesian Triangle. Of course, the Polynesians didn't know this. They and so these voyaging canoes, some, some maybe one or two hit Rapa Nui, but many would have just carried on into the Pacific where there's absolutely nothing between here and South America. So it's quite a, a really sort of fascinating, but potentially quite tragic period of, of activity. The island itself is dominated 
by uh, three different peaks. You can see this is Rano Cao, Taravaca, and Poike. And it's these peaks which basically, or these volcanic cones, which define the island. But this is, this is what uh, it's so well known for. And this is what drew us to the island, making no bones about it, investigating, looking towards uh, monuments, the making of monuments, rather than the sort of the way people have tended to, to look at these things, wanting to know how, how did they move the, how did they move the statues, the moai, how did they move the top knots, how did they get them on? You know, the same sort of questions that people ask about Stonehenge, of course, we'll never be able to answer those. We were much more in the social aspects of construction and what those related to. The thing about these, these uh, the Ahu upon which the Moai stand is their distribution. And as you can see, they basically run around the coast of the island. The, the statues them, themselves, they're all uh, mounted on these Ahu and they all face inland. And, and when I, before I actually started reading about Rapa Nui, I always assumed that the statues faced outwards. So in this presentation, I, we're just going to think about two, two things. Why are the Ahu positioned as they are around the sort of the edge of the island? And why, are the, why is the gaze of the Moai focused inland? To address this, we're going to have to go and look at a whole, a whole series of different things, which uh, hopefully I can bring together nicely at the end. So the first thing we've got to think about is uh, ancient Polynesian cosmology. And in, the interesting thing about this is it's based on procreation. So you, can, you could see it as a, what we might term a generative cosmology. The important point here is because of that, it constantly, you know, there has to be constant rituals of regeneration and renewal. And this, as, you'll, as we'll see in a minute, is potentially quite problematic. So if we think of uh, Polynesian life as a series of regenerative transition, transactions, um, we need to understand the cosmological principles in which governed, to some extent, Polynesian life. And there's, there tend to be these two, these two realms, and these two realms we, uh, came into being during creation. One is called Ao, and that's the everyday realm of light and active. This is the human realm. The other realm is, is, called, is Po, and this is the sacred, it's the time, it's darkness, it's, it's divinity, it's, it's basically the realm of deities, ancestors. It's important that these two, so you have to, so you have to have these transactions between these two realms, and yet it's really important that they're kept apart, and the reason we can, or the way perhaps we can think about this, is that um, if, say, in Christian beliefs or Muslim or whatever, you would say that uh, the deity is is categorically different from the living. That is, if you went to church, you went to a cathedral, whatever, you're not going to come face to face with with God. There's intermediaries. In, because um, Polynesian life is based on the flows of genealogy and such like, there is no categorical difference between deities and living. That is, there's a, a basically a direct line between our and poor. And yet the paradox here is they must never come together because if these two domains come together, the world would end. So we have to have transaction, transactions between the two and yet they have to be completely kept apart. There's two, con <clears throat> two main concepts in, in Polynesian life, one of which is less important to us, the other is quite important. The first is mana, and this is, um, these terms are very difficult in, in terms of translation, but mana is a sort of, um, a, a fl it flows through the, through the generations and along genealogical lines, 
but it's only detectable in efficacy. So this is something I'm not going to talk about, but here we have a real tension between achieved status based on efficacy and ascribed status best based on genealogy. And the way those two things are played out are really quite interesting, but they're not the subject of this talk. But what we are more interested in is the concept of taboo. Now it's taboo that provides the structure, the rules, the sanctions that allow the rituals to take place where there's a, where in those rituals, there's at least some degree a conjunction or linkage between ow and poor. And if you remember back to the earlier diagram, where there's no division, there's no categorical shift between the ancestors and deities and the everyday, everyday people, then this is why tapu is such an important structuring principle in Polynesian life, because to break tapu has extremely severe consequences, not least it can threaten existence itself. So in this respect, if we think of these, um, if we think of ritual and process of regeneration as man or procreative power coming in one direction, sacrifice and so on going the other, structured and controlled by tapu. I want to shift now and think about where, from whence the Polynesians. And there's, a, and it varies according to Island to Island, mainly across uh, Eastern Polynesia is known as Hawaii, and it's this mythical place of origin which is somewhere in the west. On Rapa Nui it's called Hiva, and it's, ex it's exactly the same. It's basically a Polynesian homeland, a mythical homeland, um, which to some degree does correspond with this notion of poor, because when the dead return to Hawaii, they're also going to the domain of poor. It's, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but I'm just simplifying it for this for this talk. But where is Hawaii? And this is typ typical of archaeologists. There was and admittedly a long time in the past, but people still write about it, trying to see, find out where Hawaii is. And it's a bit like trying to search for the Garden of Eden. All it is, is it's somewhere in the West. But the important aspect of that is the whole population creation and colonization of Polynesia is basically voyages which run from West to East. And those voyages leap from all the way across Poly, settling lands as they go, then going on to, to somewhere somewhere else. So the vo so the thing I want to try and get across here is that this great age of voyaging and the numerous voyages which were set out from various islands in this eastward directions were replicating, they were replicating this ancestral journey from Hawaii through uh, from and in, say into Western Polynesia and Eastern Polynesia. Again, the important thing here is the sea, the sea as a conduit between not only Hawaii and populated islands, but also potentially between Ao and Poor. So Hawaii is this sort of dual element. It's this, it's the domain of of, Ao, of Poor. And it's also this myth, this mythical uh, homeland where the deities and ancestors reside. So on death, uh, the, the dead person, or one of the spirits, because there's multiple spirits, of the dead person walks along a spirit road in a westerly direction. And in any number of islands, and presumably all Polynesian islands, it's just we know about a few of these, you have these so-called jumping off points. And these are normally spectacular land masses, points projecting out into the sea. So we have one in Hawaii, we have New Zealand, and we have in Rarotonga. So under certain circumstances, with a degree of contingency, the sea is a conduit between these between these two domains, as well as a conduit from the island back to Hawaii. 
And one of the ways in which this conduit or these roots, be it vis-a-vis vis vis the sea, or it's a little bit more complicated than that, because uh, one of the domain where pore is internalized, for instance, if, uh, if in say in childbirth, the, the child comes from inside the body to outside the body, it's moving from the domain of pore to uh, the outside world. And because of this, this need to separate these two domains, one of the solutions which takes on a paramount role in Polynesia is the concept of wrapping. And wrapping comes in many forms. And, and once that's appreciated, it allows different, um, different areas, different elements of Polynesian life to be examined in, within the same sort of analytical framework. So I just want to very quickly think about wrapping. Um, as I say, it allows it allows these linkages be, to be made between things which disparate elements which previously you wouldn't have, have made any connection with at all. And it has a different element. So wrap, so wrapping as concealments. And of course, coming up to Christmas, this is exactly what we like to see. We like to see many wrapped gifts under the Christmas tree. But also wrapping protects uh, from from outside and um, you know that we, we in fact in today's world we tend to wrap everything and what's it being protected being protected from germs of course we never see germs we just accept that they're there just in many reasons any many areas of the world pollution comes in various forms none of which is is visible oh, so, oh there's a nuclear reactor but it's okay we're OK because it's wrapped in lead. So here we've got wrapping, which is protecting uh, and containing something which is inside. So it's it's actually protecting from from the inside. Um, another aspect of wrapping is it can put together delicious foods. So here is fish and chips and uh, it unifies. It's not just foods. I'm just using this as an example, but wrapping unifies disparate elements. I mean, who would ever think of putting battered fish and chips together in a delicious meal? It's also paradoxical because whilst wrapping can conceal, it also reveals or in certain situations it can reveal. So it's got this sort of this sort of paradoxical element to it. And we can think of it perhaps as a process of indication in that respect. And of course, Christmas morning, everything is realised. Um, wrapping is unwrapped, disclosure and revelation and hopefully truly wonderful gifts. With that in mind, I want to quickly jump across now to tattooing and Polynesia is the home of the tattoo. This is where the word comes from and the Polynesians were very, very heavily tattooed. One of the most interesting works, which is for me anyway, which has been done on tattooing is by the anthropologist Alfred Jell, and um, he makes a whole range range of points, but he's basically focusing, looking at the tattoo as a form of wrapping and it's it accentuates and adds to the interface. So he's, he's he sees uh, skins and membranes and boundaries working in different ways, and I don't really need to go through these, but they're, it's, they're quite interesting and it does show um, shed a quite a different light on the process of, of tattooing. The thing I do want to, or the two points I do want to point to, is the notion that what Jal doesn't talk about and doesn't really think about so much is the materiality of wrapping. And of course, um, I think we can all assume that that is really, really quite fundamental and quite important as different materials will be used in different situations, different contexts, because of their different qualities. There's also a degree of fluidity in this. And I'm sort of thinking back to Mike's presentation right at the beginning. The other point about gel is the skin and the tattoos were really important as a sort of armor or second skin, helping to separate these two realms. And if you remember, I said how poor is seen as internal and how is external. So it's very important in doing that. And the reason that it's tattooing is so taboo 
is to tattoo, punctures that interface, punctures the skin, fluids enter and fluids come out, ink or, or dyes go in and, and blood come in, comes out. The whole process of tattooing is strictly controlled and heavily ta tattoo. One of the things which is really interesting about Polynesian tattoos is the emphasis on orifices. And, and it's that which I think is, is really quite, is quite crucial for us to, to understand perhaps in a minute what's going on in the island. Why are orifices so important? Why do they need this extra decoration, this extra tapu, this extra protection? Because they too are conduits between the inside and the outside. And here we can see linkage between these totally different things, but also we can see similarities in the requirement of, of to control, to structure, and, and contain to some degree conduits between different realms. Perhaps t female tattooing emphasises this even more. It does emphasise orifices, and not only is um, the external, so here we see the external skin tattooed, but also inside the mouth. So it's not just the, it's actually part of the, the root in, inwards is actually, is actually controlled and contained through this notion of wrapping vis-a-vis -vis tattoos. Here, I just want to quickly, I hope I've got a bit of time left, quickly move from that uh, to thinking about this, because what we're really dealing with is homologies between different things, different elements. I want to think about the homology between tattooing the human body and rock art and petroglyphs in the landscape and islands. Because just as we can see there's an emphasis on uh, this, on orifice in the human body, we see a very similar thing in the way in which landscape is is understood. So there's a similar sort of orifice in the land, say caves, passageways. And whilst we were actually working on the island, there was another project looking at lava tubes and caves by a group from Poland. And any number of lava tubes and entrances to caves, they found petroglyphs and decoration on the inside. And this is just this is just one example. This is a cave in the northwest part of the island. Interestingly, this isn't, well, maybe not unexpectedly, this isn't restricted to Rapa Nui. This occurs in different areas of East Polynesia. This is Hawaii, and here we have a, a cave. And in terms of understanding conduits, in Hawaii, you get burials in caves, in canoes you know, it be beautifully bringing these different elements together. And as you can see, profusely decorated around the, the cave, the, the orifice, nor, of it, nor is it restricted to caves. It also, uh, volcanic cones are also conduits between these two realms. And this is Ranokao, this is on the southwestern uh, end of Rapa Nui. And so here we see all the rock art and petroglyphs focusing around the crate, this massive crater of Rano Cow in the in the north in the southwest. And interestingly, just as with the tattooing of the mouth, it's not just the external surfaces which are decorated, but it's internal rock faces which are not visible. That you know we we can't. There's, there's rock art on the other side of that rock, which isn't accessible to be to be seen, just as perhaps tattooing inside the mouth. So, galloping through all this, I want to bring all these elements together, and hopefully we can start to understand what's happening on, on Rapa Nui, and why the Ahu were all around the island, where they wrapped the island, and why they're all facing inland. And just at this, this point to remember, that, um, the, that I made right at the beginning, that this voyage, these, this age of voyaging, this period of voyaging, these, these journeys which are undertaken from island to island can be understood as replicating these an, an ancestral voyages. This is, um, this developed Salin's idea, Marshall Salin's idea of mythopraxis, um, where, and this is beautifully said in this quote from Johansson, um, where, was it, uh, well, the final form of cosmic is currently the ancestors appear in the living as history emerges and is actualized. 
basically events under certain circumstances are constantly re referenced back to um, mythical events in the past and in doing so conjure up all the elements and, and associations with, with these events. Okay, so just finally looking at the, where these are who are situated. They're large monuments and yet they're situated in low-lying areas. So this is a typical example. You see this as sort of land coming down, this low period. There's the big, the big Ahu running along by the coast. It's not situated in the most visible aspect. If they shifted a little bit to the, would be the, this is in the south, so it'd be to the to the east, it would be up on a ridge. It'd be far more visible. So they're strategically placed, but what for? And the and of course it's obvious in a way. It's access to the sea, and this is Tahai. This is a uh, an Ahu complex in the west of the island, and people tend not to know or talk too much about the the central elements of these Ahu complexes. Here's the here's one Ahu. Here's another Ahu. Here's another Ahu. But in the centre is a canoe ramp. The reason that um, can, the canoe ramps aren't emphasised and so on is because it's, voyaging isn't such a central element from Rapa Nui because we know it's the easternmost part of Polynesia. But the people who lived on the island didn't know that. So you can imagine that they set off on voyages expecting, as the expectation was, land to come, to, ride, uh, to arise over the horizon as they travelled east. So the, the canoe ramps have really been minimised and also obviously the lack of, of trees on the island. How do they make the canoes? Well, they made them by by small sections and they sewed them together. That's how they made them. So here's the canoe ramp at Tahai. And the, the main thing to point is that the stones, which, I just want to point the stones which form the basis of this are, the, are these round stones called poro. These are round water-worn stones. So we'll see the significance of that in a second. And here's another here's another big Ahu. This is in the south coast. This is Akahama, Akahanga, and it's adjacent to a small bay. So Sue so, so Hamilton um, focused attention during the project on Ahu and found canoe ramps or bits of canoe ramps and so on associated with most of the major Ahu. So what's going on? So why what why is the canoe ramp central, and why are they why are these uh, Ahu with the statues flanking it on either side? Well, if you think about um, what I've talked about in terms of uh, conduits between realms, orifices, and such like, you can now start to understand what's going on and why. The, the architecture of the Ahu how it is how it is, because to the transgression between the island world and the sea, which potentially, just like all roads and so, leads directly back to Hebeiki, under certain circumstances, and, and particularly in the launching of voyaging canoes, I would argue requires this ad uh, additional um, sanction, this ad additional tapu, if you like, to control structure the transgression between these two domains. And when they, so that, you think, oh, that's very interesting. Um, but when they were doing excavations at Now Now, this is an Ahu on the north coast of the island, they found, uh, they started finding bits of white coral, shaped white coral, and then they started finding um, little bits of or whole pieces and some of red scoria discs and black obsidian uh, discs. And all of a sudden they realized that the, 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 uh, the uh, Moai had eyes. They were able to see. And so we can now start to put this into a much broader context of Polynesian life, where things, um, tapu, ebbs and flows. Things are not constantly tapu. Tapu comes into being in certain occasions and ebbs. And I can't help but think that during particular time, say the launching of the canoe or when particular things were going on, the eyes were put into the moai and the moai became animate. And 
when the when the when the events were not going on, the eyes were removed and stored, perhaps in god houses, a little bit like um, the uh, the staff gods you see in Rarotonga and other parts of, of Polynesia. So passing between domains passes through and by and in front of the gaze of the ancestors. And we see that just as uh, rock art works with orifices, tattoos work with orifices, so the Moai work with orifices in controlling and sanctioning that transgression. And just to just to uh, to to wrap to wrap up, um, those those poro which uh, basically his see the bottom this is uh, the Moai sitting on the ahu and you can see the in sort of foreground the area between the, the what would be the ancestors near the people as is flawed with this or it's got this architecture of rounded pebbles where <clears throat> where are these rounded pebbles coming from well they're coming from that very interface itself the only plate they so this is a materialization of of this interface between the land and the sea and it's deployed in the Ahu is this um, this this area, this liminal area, if you like, between the people and the deities. So to approach the Mayas across the platform, the Sustapara, and it is really a, a materiality of interface. And just to draw, drive this point home and see how materials can be deployed strategically to recreate those conditions. This is a canoe shaped house. This is a sort of typical house on Rapa Nui. But can you see this sort of area in the forecourt, the very area you have to pass to gain access to the house is, is covered by these Poirot. So here we're seeing the stuff of the sea. I think Sue calls them sea stones. But there really are this materiality of interface being laid down to, to project and conjure up this notion of transition and, and so on between between domains. And just to this is one this is wonderful. This is a drawing by someone um, by a group who were there in the 1770s. And so some and not only have you got the product, but look, you've got these little so here you've got that replication in miniature of, of receding between the inside and the outside of the house. I have no doubt that the insides of these houses were mainly used for sleep and sleep allowed people to um, engage in some way or another with the domain of poor. So it's not surprising that we see this replication of what you see on them with the Moai and on the Ahu in the everyday world of houses. And here are those dear little moai which flank them. Unfortunately, because they're so easy to remove, they're now distributed around museums of the world. So hopefully by putting uh, a quick gallop through Polynesian, the Polynesian world um, and putting together different ingredients and elements, you can start to understand not only why the um, the Moai wrap the island, basically containing it, but also why the Moai look inland. And I, I must just before I finish, I must confess that when you start thinking along these lines, it makes me wonder about the actual process of tattooing, which people always think of is um, all to do with outward projection. But maybe this gives us a little bit of an insight into the, into an, another role of tattooing, which is inward projection as well. But that's something for some other time. OK, thank you very much. And thank and you thank very you much, very Colin. Colin. It was um, um, absolutely fascinating. So th thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we'll, we'll move swiftly on now to um, our next speaker, um, Mari Top. And um, Mari is, um, sorry, going, I've lost my place there slightly, my apologies. Yeah, so um, we only have Mari with us today, um, but that's fine as she is the, the lead on this anyway. Um, Mari has a master's in applied sports and exercise psychology with Staffordshire University and lectures in psychology and sport and fitness at Inverness College UHI. Mari has research interests in the links between physical activity, 
community belonging and well-being and has also worked in community and NHS settings delivering community health and well-being initiatives, including the introduction to the UK of both the applied suicide intervention skills and mental health first aid programmes. Finally, Mari has competed internationally for Great Britain in both mountain running and road cycling. So a diverse set of skills here uh, on, on display today, but um, specifically Mari is going to be talking today on an exploration of the perceived effect of intergenerational community coastal rowing on shared social identity and well-being. Mari. Hi everybody, can you hear me okay? Excellent, I can't see myself for some unknown reason, but not to worry, uh, maybe that's a blessing. Also, well done to Colin for bringing Christmas into his presentation. Top marks for that. Can't promise to do that, sadly, but I will try and get us finished Oops, in time for uh, lunch, which is always important. So I was looking at uh, community coastal rowing and how that impacted on shared social identity, connection to place and well-being. And so thinking about the kind of history of, of looking at well-being and blue spaces, uh, there's research out there which shows uh, that connection with nature enhances our health and well-being and that furthermore exercising in nature enhances that effect. So it, it gives an increased positive mental health boost, if you like, uh, if you exercise in nature and on top of uh, the boost to our mental health of being active. And finally, uh, Foley has done a lot of work looking at the kind of traditional aspects of the health benefits of water. So water has traditionally in many cultures been ascribed therapeutic qualities. And the picture on the slide there, I'm sorry, with so many photographers uh, in the audience, it's a little bit nerve wracking because I don't have a fancy camera, but you might recognize that as the Clutie well, which isn't a million miles from, from where I sit at the moment. Um, and there's many other um, local kind of wells of health bringing uh, qualities around our local communities. So thinking about blue spaces in a bit more detail and pathways to health, um, there's research that suggests that there's maybe three pathways linking blue spaces uh, to health. So number one, they provide opportunities for being active, which can improve our physical and mental health. But they also provide opportunities for us to be uh, socially interacting with others. So if, if we're in these spaces, um, we're more likely to be uh, interacting with other people. And finally, thinking back to those therapeutic spaces, being in these blue spaces can give this enhanced uh, state of mental relaxation and reduce our stress. So it's thought that these are the three pathways which link to the, the health benefits of being in blue space. But as a psychologist, we're always looking at um, theories that we can tie in uh, along as uh, looking at health. So we were decided to look at how community rowing links to social identity. So Cameron in 2004 talked about social identity as having these three elements. So cognitive centrality is about how important um, our group membership is to how we think about ourselves. So how central is membership of that group to how we view ourselves. In-group affect is about how being a member of that group impacts on our feelings and how we feel. And in-group ties is about how closely we feel connected to everybody in that group and how much we feel we belong. So those three elements are really what we're talking about when we're looking at social identity. And there has been other research out with community rowing, of course, looking at group membership and the impact of social identity on health. So Jet and Atal in 2017 found that uh, having strong group membership and social identity can enhance our self-esteem, uh, can give an increased sense of purpose and belonging, increase self-efficacy uh, and our, our ability to believe in, in ourselves 
and increase our ability to cope with change and our resilience. They also found that uh, belonging to a group increases our social support, so we're more likely to accept social support from people in that particular group, but we're also more likely to offer people in that group uh, social support. And we have a stronger belief in what we can achieve collaboratively as a group if we're part of this uh, group. And we're more likely to uh, accept help from in-group members than out-group members. So, so this is the prior research. So uh, what we looked at in terms of our hypothesis was whether or not community rowing offers an opportunity for participants to build a shared social identity and enhanced well-being. Uh, so we expected to find that social identity with community rowing would be positively associated uh, with both social support offered and social support received and that social identity from community rowing would be positively associated with team efficacy and that we would see this positive association also with our mental health and well-being and our physical health. So we decided that we would do a uh, kind of two phases to this research. So uh, phase one was a cross-sectional survey of uh, looking at the health, well-being and social identity and really looking at the hypothesis that we just uh, saw in the previous slides. Uh, so we had 67 participants just really using local clubs here on the Black Isle, so both Cromarty and Och, community rowing clubs. And we had a spread of ages, as I said, it's intergenerational uh, from kind of 15 up to 79 with uh, the, the modal age of participants being in their 50s. So measures that we used uh, as part of this, we used the social identity questionnaire for sport, the WEMWEB's mental health and wellbeing scale to look at um, mental wellbeing. We looked at collective efficacy in sport, and social support both received and provided, and a single item measure of physical health. And what we found were that on just about on the whole, our uh, hypothesis were supported. So we did find positive moderate correlations between uh, social identity, so group membership as part of community rowing and mental well-being and also with group membership and community rowing and physical health. We found these positive moderate correlations between social identity and team efficacy and positive moderate correlations between social identity and so social support received and a large correlation between team efficacy and uh, social support offered and social support received. We didn't find a significant relationship between shared social identity and social support offered to others, which was quite surprising when you think about previous research, uh, and which would suggest that if you were part of a group, you would be more likely to offer support to others in that group. But we thought maybe this was because we're in such rural communities, uh, people tend to know everybody in their community. So, they maybe think of themselves as always available to help others as part of that broader community rather than just thinking about um, their, their kind of coastal rowing group. We also found uh, team efficacy significant related to social identity, which had been previously predicted uh, in studies, which show that social identity leads to an increase in collective efficacy and, and the belief of what the group can achieve together. And particularly for rowing, uh, there's been previous research by Zumeta et al that found perceived emotional synchrony and shared flow mediates that relationship between in-group identification and collective efficacy. And when you think about what you're doing in the boat, the synchronicity of movements in coastal rowing requires engagement of all our senses while sharing those physical conditions on the water. So you have this kind of emotional synchronicity while you're rowing. Uh, so that maybe explains that strong link between social identity and team collective efficacy because we've got that shared synchronicity within the boat. Oh, so hang on, I've managed to, here we go, blocked myself. 
So phase two, we uh, looked at really what um, community rowing meant to the participants. Uh, so we had uh, semi-structured interviews, it was participant-led and a, a very collaborative approach using photo elicitation. So photo elicitation allows the photos rather than the person to become the focus in the interviews. So hopefully helped participants to feel more at ease and allow them access to deeper insights. Also uh, helping to improve recall. And in this instance, uh, participants um, took the, used their own photos and chose which photos to bring to discuss to the interviews. And then we used uh, thematic analysis as part of um, considering the amount of data that we had. So the themes that we pulled out here were uh, duchas, about uh, that sense of place and belonging, looked at self-concept, uh, belonging itself, health and transformation. So I'm just going to uh, talk you through these with some examples uh, from, from what people said in the interviews. So Dukas was about really heritage and connection to place and, and some element of traditional narratives and traditional skills. Um, so we can see that first quote there is talking about being able to pass on uh, traditional skills. So uh, teaching, in this instance, they were talking about teaching young children how to row and passing on those skills. Also, the bringing back of traditional boat building skills was highly valued within the communities. So loving to see when the boat builders have worked and what they're producing. Uh, and that sense of, of belonging and, and bringing everybody together. Uh, one of the other, it was too long to put in as a quote, but one, one of the other things I wanted to mention as part of this theme was one of the uh, young people that we interviewed actually talked about their, their feeling around water and how um, they had been really quite scared of the water when they were young. Uh, due to like traditional stories and traditional narratives linked to uh, the Kelpie and, and being quite fearful of, of what lay beneath the water and uh, whether something might be uh, coming to get them almost. So I found that was really interesting to see on the surface this very modern, confident young person uh, talking about um, the traditional narratives and how that shaped how they'd viewed the water until obviously now they're quite confident on the water with their uh, complete immersion really in this particular instance in, in uh, community rowing. Next, we uh, the next theme we had was self-concept. So looking at uh, developing people's skills and confidence uh, in their physical abilities, but also their kind of technical abilities with rowing and, and coxing. So feeling more competent, and then thinking about what they're able to give back. So the one of the quotes there is about that positive boost to well-being that you get from feeling like you're able to contribute to everybody else. So they're talking about uh, having the skills to be a good cox and, and the fact that other people need those skills and it gives them a sense of worth. And uh, that ties into valuable social roles and also ego integrity. So the second quote, thinking about uh, really finding some value, finding something uh, perhaps even later on in life that you really, really excel at. And belonging, no surprise to find that in there, but lots of talk about how uh, having to work together uh, brings people together and they feel closer. So uh, with community coastal rowing, communities have to, to fundraise together and then work together to build their own boats. So there's lots of superordinate goals, things that you can't achieve on your own, but you can achieve if you work together as a team. Um, so even in terms of getting the boats down to the water, you wouldn't manage it on your own. They're quite heavy. And obviously to, to row, you need your other rowers and your cocks with you. Uh, lots of focus on group identity and, and the picture we've got there is uh, a well-known uh, local rower who set up uh, the Off Community Rowing Club and you can see they're really signifying their identity. They got the car, um, kind of, I don't know what you call it, but sprayed or wrapped or whatever in that exact colour of our team kit and uh, obviously had a private number plate to, 
to go along with that. So signifiers of identity, uh, uh, something that goes along with that strong group identity. And a feeling of support and trust between everybody and the fact that actually you are out on the water, weather can change and you have to really uh, trust everybody else in the boat with you and strong social cohesion as part of that. The next theme uh, that we had was looking at health. So a real focus on mental health and well-being came out from the interviews and, and actual recovery from periods of poor mental health as well. Being on the water also seemed to help with emotional regulation and uh, being able to cope with any adverse life events that, that, that might happen. As, as you might expect, people were really positive about the actual physical activity itself, leading to improved physical health um, and the fact that they felt more motivated to be active as part of being part of the rowing club and how much they enjoyed that all tied into health benefits they gained from rowing. So I'll just leave you to kind of read through these quotes, but you can see the first one's talking about a period of really uh, poor mental health that the person went through and, and how being involved in rowing really helped them to come out the other side of that. And the second quote's looking at how um, they're talking about actually, although, although they like being outside in general, they find being on the sea in particular very calming and the fact that it kind of brings people together and, and leads to these closer relationships. So uh, the final theme that we had was looking at transformation and that can be individual transformation. So uh, rowing really being a catalyst for some people to really reevaluate their how they were living their life. So that first quote really talks to that about uh, the fact they got really kind of involved in the community rowing and then it made them actually reevaluate how how much time they were spending at work and how how they were living and how much stress they were under and actually changing that to allow them to to have a more balanced lifestyle and transformation of that connection between people and place so bringing back almost those strong ties between people and place um, because I guess the research was taking place on the Black Isle which has seen changes over the last uh, 40, 50 years with, with the bridge and, and an influx of uh, people living here and, and certainly I, I used to live in, in Shetland before I stayed here where you have a really strong connection between people and place and, and perhaps uh, rowing is a way to to bring these kind of expanding communities that we have on the Black Isle together. And you can see uh, so the quote there in the middle about the fact some of the things maybe that they used to see in the past beginning to happen again. So uh, people beginning to swim together in the summer, for example. And actually the fact that once you are part of this uh, community and you feel like you belong, which is really enhanced through community rowing, you're more likely then to, to be involved in other community projects. So uh, people are beginning to be more involved in all sorts of community initiatives, which are, which are really uh, enhancing the well-being of everybody in the community. I have no idea about the time, so I'm um, just about right, I think. <laughs> so in summary, phase one was uh, quantitative research. So we did find that stronger social identity was associated with mental health and well-being, with improved physical health, with enhanced collective efficacy and uh, social support received. Whereas phase two uh, allowed us to explore what this meant for people. So they found that community coastal rowing, or we found that it really strengthened those ties between people in place and built a stronger shared social identity, which yeah, enhanced people's mental and physical health and led to increased trust and support, but also led to these increased pro-social behaviours uh, amongst our local communities, which is a real positive. 
And finally, I had taken these slides out, but I've popped them in because I thought we might need them for time. Uh, so for me, I, it had a real personal impact on myself when, when I approached clubs to ask if I could do this research. Uh, they were aware that I uh, have a background in competitive sport and they said only if you come and row with us, which I'd never found time to do. Um, and so I, I'd carried out all the interviews and, and done a lot of the research and then found myself reliving the experiences people had told me about afterwards, which was uh, really interesting. So, um, yeah, they talked about, you know, going away as a team. And then later on, after I'd finished the research, we went to the Skifty World Championships and you can see, well, I don't know if my camera's on, but that is me next to the person, one of the people wearing a daffodil head. So uh, we were uh, successful in, in achieving a medal position in one of those races. And, and it was a great time to be to be away as a whole community club. Um, and for me as well, also rede rediscovering my sense of self. I don't think I'll be the only person who who grew up really on the sea, uh, very much so, and then went away actually to Edinburgh University initially. And, you know, then I got really into competitive sport and travelled all around the world. And none of that really involved being on the sea. Uh, and although I lived in, in Shetland, I had a, a young family at the time and, and was working. And it's only really going back to coastal rowing, which they kind of said, if you want to do this research, you have to be involved. That has helped me really to find part of myself, which I guess that I'd left behind in childhood. And honestly, I feel so much better for it. Uh, so that's me. I think I'm just about right. Any questions from anybody? And I'll come out of slideshow. So hopefully I can see. Actually, not sure how to stop sharing. Uh, you're all, you're almost there, Murray. It's it's the, uh, the the tray button. There you go. Well done. So so Murray, thank thank you very much. That was um, a really fascinating um, personal and indeed professional uh, narrative, um, which I'm sure has has raised lots of questions in in people's minds. We are a bit, um, to say the least, uh, tight for time. Um, we're meant to be finishing for lunch in, in one minute's time. Um, but um, I, I, I think we can we can go over slightly um, if, if there are any questions. I, uh, only five minutes, I would suggest. Um, so questions, are, I'm, I'm very aware that some people can't see the chat function at the moment. So um, and I can't see when I'm trying to kind of manage this, both the chat and um, participants function. So I see that there is currently, as far as I'm aware, just the one question in um, in the chat. And I'll ask that of Colin in a moment. But then can if people can put their hands up, raise a hand if they have questions to ask, we'll switch to that and then I'll, I'll bring people in um, when when I when we have questions to ask. So um, as I say, before I switch to the raised hands mode, Colin, um, I have a question here from Richard Keating. And Richard asks, um, if walking can be seen as pilgrimage, which it is by many walking artists, and if part of its purpose is to reveal the mythical, um, which again, it does for many, then what might the realms be that our walking process is keeping apart? It's a nice challenging meaty question for you there, Colin. It, it is, Ian. And, and before I answer it, I just hope you notice the joy on people's faces as they unwrap the presents in my pictures. Um, the, uh, I don't know, uh, I suppose the, I, I was really interested in Mary's talk because at first I thought there's going to be absolutely no common ground whatsoever, but a lot of the things she was talking about I could see had implications for the notion of voyaging um, and lots of discussion around that. Um, I don't know, I suppose uh, the inside and the outside is an obvious one, you know, during lockdown I. I, ne I never used to go on aimless walking, but I, I did during lockdown and discovered a world, a world which I really didn't know existed. Um, so I'm not sure it keeps domains apart. We've kind of created these two different domains and uh, maybe maybe walking is conjunction between them. 
I can't really offer much more than that, I'm afraid. Thanks very much, Colin. We're we're um, having a very lively discussion in in the chat there, and Mari is picking up um, some some of the questions there. Um, Mari, I I don't know whether you want to just reply audio audibly to to everybody um, or to to one or two of those questions because, as I said already, we don't not everybody is able to see the chat. So, yeah. Um, okay. So uh, Wilma, who I know, thanks Wilma, and I think you're speaking later on. Uh, was asking if it was the same participant groups for both stages of the research and the answer was yes it was because uh, we gave people the option for taking part in stage two and then contacted them if they were keen to do that and um, during the pandemic it's quite interesting different clubs did things differently but um, certainly our local club did uh, like a lot of zoom training so even when we were in strict lockdown people were still sort of spending time virtually together and training uh, but I would say we're I don't know it's hard to know it feels a bit like we're not out quite as much I guess we're in quite strange times at the moment um, oh and I'd like to know more about Anthony's talking about the Nordic Clint clinker boat tradition and yeah so yeah I would love to know more about that I'm obsessed with boats but I did as I say grow grow up on the water and then move away move away from it and I'm happy to be brought back to it um I'm just reading Zoe's question all oh, right so whether you're in part of the group or out, out of the group is that what you're meaning Zoe I didn't find that it was more the focus was on this was bringing communities together both within their own communities but also I uh, don't know if there's anybody from the Black Isle here but traditionally like Och and Cromarty are kind of rivals so mostly <laughs> mostly the rowing has brought those two communities really uh, closer together um, I know a lot more people in Cromarty than I otherwise would you know barring you know kids that are at school together um, so I feel it's more brought people together and I think this is why I partly brought in the fact I feel like the Black Isle is quite a changed or a changing community having moved here and found it was it's you know it's so close to Inverness so it feels like people do their own thing a lot and they don't really have that strong bond that you maybe have in some of the island communities is my impression as an incomer to the Black Isle but becoming part of the rowing club has helped to break down those barriers and and then people are more invested in other aspects of community life and volunte volunteering in other areas so I don't know if that's kind of what you're meaning Zoe but so I think there there are definitely issues around how much do you feel you belong in, in these communities but we, I, I can none of that came up it was more people talked about how the rowing had helped the communities come together was what came up I, I don't know if that answers I hope it does uh, sorry sorry to jump in here both and and to interrupt this um this lively conversation I I just wanted to say we're we're now five minutes over, so so we probably should be thinking of of stopping for lunch. Um, but there there is one last opportunity to to ask either uh, Mari um, or Colin your your last pressing question, if if you have such a thing. I just say to Catherine, I would agree that the only slight discrepancy would be around competition. Uh, and mostly the competitions are quite lighthearted, but there there have been a few that were maybe a little bit close to the bone. Uh, and so um, it, it may be all's fair in love and war, except on, on regatta day, perhaps a little bit. So it depends. No further comment. Thank you very much. And um, I'll, I'll wrap this up now. Um, thank you very much to both our speakers. I just noticed a really interesting comment in the chat there. Um, Fiona, thank you very much for that. Uh, talking about David Ganji's um, wonderful um, Sea Journeys book and writings. Um, it's entirely apposite that we uh, that we end this uh, session with with a mention of David's work. Um, he did give a presentation for for the Edge um, earlier on this year, and and you know that was great. And um, yes, indeed, I, I entirely agree with you. Um, you know, they both um, both. 
uh, presentations are, are at their heart, aren't they, in part at least about um, journeying as learning. So, um, so thank you very much to, to both our presenters. And um, we'll now break for lunch and try and resume um, on time at um, 12.45 with the, the first of our parallel sessions. And I would hope, I'm sure, that you all have instructions about um, joining those two sessions and the instructions will undoubtedly be published in the chat during lunch. So thank you very much and thank you very much to both our speakers for um, a terrific um, pre-lunch session. Everybody go and enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Goodbye.